I wonder if it's just because we've not been. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Edinburgh International Conference Centre. My name is Emma Dodds, and it's my absolute pleasure to be your host here for today's Scottish Golf Conference. Now, first of all, thank you all for coming. It's fantastic to see so many of you here in the room to enjoy this 2018 conference. You may notice there are a few empty seats, though. Now, there has been some real disruption. Surprise, surprise. Um, so anyone who is coming in, please just forgive them because uh, it has been travel disarray, basically, that has not allowed them to be here on time. So we might have a few latecomers coming in, but of course we will make them feel welcome. So as I say, it's fantastic to have you all here today. We've got a great day lined up for you um, over the course of the next couple of hours. So I do hope you find it worthwhile and of course, indeed, informative as well. It's been a fantastic 2018 for golf in Scotland. At the very highest level, of course, we've had the golf at Carnoustie, we've had the men and women competing at Gullen, so lots to reflect on as far as the top level golf. A lot further down as well, we've had success on the Challenge Tour, and of course, at club level and amateur level, which we will hear about 
over the course of today. I also want to welcome our viewers who are watching online because times are changing and we're delighted that this is being streamed on social media today as well. So if you haven't been able to make it here to Edinburgh, then you are still able to, to watch online. So a very good morning to you for that one as well. Now today's conference is going to focus very much on Scottish golf's commitment to developing the game. And you yourself will also have a chance to engage with some of the presentations that are taking place up here over the course of today. We're going to have presentations from the leadership of Scottish Golf and also some of the industry experts that are coming up here to talk to us as well. So very much a lot to look forward to. And again, thank you for your time and being here because it is about you and your continued commitment is paramount to helping grow the game here in Scotland. Now, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping for you today. If I could ask that all of your mobile phones are put onto silent, just out of respect for anyone who is coming up here onto the stage to, to give a presentation or answer some questions. So that's the first port of call. While you have your phone out though, don't put it away because as I mentioned, you are going to be able to engage with what is going on on the stage up here today. We have an interactive platform that is going to allow you all to ask questions of the panel and also, as I say, some of Scottish Golf's leadership as well. How to get involved is this. If I could ask you all to join the Wi-Fi network here, if you would like to ask questions, if you join the Wi-Fi network, it is the EICC Wi-Fi network and the name of the network is called Delegate. So I'll talk you through it as we go before we, we kick on with the actual conference. So it's the Delegate Wi-Fi and the password for that is Haymarket, all lowercase if you've all found that. Now to actually join the debate once you're connected to the Wi-Fi, you just need to open your browser and head to the internet site. It's www. and it's slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. How's everyone getting on? It's all very quiet. Is that concentration? So once you get to the website, slido.com, if you've all managed to get that far, I'd ask you to use the event code, hashtag Scottish Golf, all lowercase, all one word, hashtag Scottish Golf. Now, once you get this far, there are two options. You can click on the profile button, which is in the top right-hand side of your screen, you can register with who you are, or it's quite acceptable if you would prefer to remain anonymous when you're, you're typing your questions. It's up to you. You can put your name in and where you're from, or you can remain anonymous to, to type the questions. And once you're, you're logged in, the screen gives you two options. You can ask a question, or you can take part in a poll. Hopefully you're keeping up and you're all managing to, to navigate this okay. I know it's tricky out there in the World Wide Web. So basically, there'll be two presentations that you'll be able to, to submit questions for. And at the end of those presentations, the, the people on stage will be able to answer those questions for you. Of course, if there is a recurring theme, do forgive us if we don't ask everybody's question. We'll try and get through as many topics as we possibly can over the course of uh, this morning's session and, of course, the afternoon as well. So hopefully you're all getting on okay with that. Yes? No? Yeah, good, okay. Let's do a little bit of a test then because we're going to start a poll. It's a test poll just to familiarize yourself with how it goes. So once you're into to slido.com, if I can ask you to click on the poll button and let us know who is in the room today. We've got a, a multiple choice of answers. I know there's a, a varying array of, of delegates here today, everyone ranging from golf club members to non-members. We've got the area delegates as well who are here today. So if you can just inform us of who's in the room, it'll give us a chance to, to gauge exactly the subjects that we're going to be covering over the course of today as well. So that's just a little test to familiarize yourself. At one other point as well, if you do see the questions that are listed on slido.com and there's something that you particularly are interested in, you can like the question. And of course, if there's a lot of interest in that question, we will of course make sure it gets pushed to the top of the list of questions so that, that we can all get the answer that everybody is looking, looking for. Okay, I think we're good with that. The housekeeping's done. 
Let's press on with the conference because we've got so much to get through over the course of this morning and this afternoon. So now we are underway. I would like to ask the chair of Scottish Golf, Eleanor Cannon, to come to the stage to open this year's conference. Thank you, Emma. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Scottish Golf National Conference 2018. Firstly, respect and sincere thanks to all of you for joining us today. Golf is a game that relies very heavily on the will, commitment, energy, and sheer hard work of volunteers. We all volunteer because we care deeply about the game. To attract 450 people on this first Saturday of December is testament to that care and commitment. So, to all the past captains, captains, vice captains, presidents, vice presidents, past presidents, board members, committee members, course raters, referees, rules officials, coaches, mums, dads, grandparents and caddies. Thank you. Our clubs simply could not survive without you. That's for all of you. Now, today is all about securing the future of our beloved game here in Scotland, the home of golf. The past 10 years has been a turbulent time for the administration of golf in Scotland, and a time which has seen the game lose 5,000 golf club members a year over those 10 years. Scottish golf is now in its fourth year. As the governing body for golf in Scotland, we've taken time to understand and articulate the commercial challenges that the game faces across Scotland. And following this, had our shareholders approved increased investment on the back of our strategy and plan that was first presented to the AGM in March. The message from our shareholders has been clear and unambiguous on the back of this support. Unite the community of golfers in Scotland so that together we can all enjoy the wealth of courses in Scotland and so that together we all contribute financially to their upkeep. Today is the leadership team's opportunity to present to you our response to that challenge. Now, before I hand over to our Chief Executive, Andrew McKinley, let me first introduce you to each of the volunteer boards who are sitting with you today, and then say a few words by way of introduction to the full-time team who run Scottish Golf. Firstly, at table two, Lorna Brown. Lorna is a hard-working board member at Dunblane Golf Club. Hello, Lorna, where are you? Here's Lorna. Addy Schmash. Addy is a Scottish international player and an amateur selector for three years. Good morning, Addy. You're at table 22. There we go. There's Addy. Malcolm Padepo, a lifelong golfer, a member at Cruden Bay and at Dalmahoy, and a committed servant to Scottish golf since its, its inception in 2015. Now, Malcolm will retire from the board at the next AGM and we will formally acknowledge his retirement in due course. Today, however, I would like to put on record how instrumental he has been in successfully guiding us through the financial challenges the game has been through in the past three years. My sincere thanks, Malcolm. Malcolm is at table 15. Where's Malcolm? There he is. Stuart Darling, also a lifelong golfer, a member of Brumenau Golf Club, Stuart, you may remember, stood up here last year and gave us all a very harsh dose of reality around the challenges that the game faces and at what it needs to do to adapt successfully in the world in which we now live. Stuart is at table 19. There he is. Sean Duffy, a Scottish youth player who won a golf scholarship to Midland College, Texas in 1987. Sean is at table 14. Where's Sean? There he is. And Brendan Dick, past captain of Morton Hall Golf Club and an exceptionally experienced non-executive director sitting at table six. There is Brendan. Now, there are two directors who are not with us today. 
Bill Woodley had a previous commitment. Bill brings a wealth of experience as a trustee of the Tiger Wood Foundation. And this is a key attribute as Scottish Golf is similarly a not-for-profit organisation. And finally, Keith MacDonald, dad to our 2014 Scottish amateur champion, Gabrielle. Keith, we are thinking of you and yours at this time. So that is your board. We meet quarterly to govern the game and support the leadership team as they execute our strategy and plan. And individually, we try and offer our experience and know-how as we do our day jobs as and when required. Now, ahead of Andrew introducing his new look team, a little bit of insight into the experience that we have leading the game in Scotland. Karen Sharp is the Chief Operating Officer. Karen was previously the Chief Executive of the Scottish Ladies Golf Association and is currently Vice Captain of Kirkcaldy Golf Club. Ross Duncan, who you'll meet later, has worked for Golf in Scotland for 13 years now, and Ross is currently the captain of Peebles Golf Club. Claire Queen, the performance director, has worked for Golf in Scotland for four years, and previous to this, she was a professional golfer on the women's tour, European tour, for some seven years. And Ian, Mc Ian Forsyth, who you'll meet later on this afternoon, he joined us to head up our commercial team in March this year. Ian was charged with setting up Nike Golf Europe in the 90s, taking it to a £20 million business, before working with Nick Faldo for seven years, first as his agent, and then in a broader role, creating and running the Faldo series. And finally, our new chief executive, Andrew McKinley. Andrew is a lawyer by trade, and after a period of time in private practice, he joined the Clydesdale Bank as head of commercial contracts, and that's excellent news for Scottish Golf. Andrew then went on to become the Chief Operating Officer at the SFA, heading up operationally the governing body of our national sport. How fitting that he then chooses to join the governing body of Scotland's national game as Chief Executive. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to looking forward with you today as Andrew and his team present future options for golf clubs in Scotland as they tackle the huge commercial challenges of sustainability and growth in today's ever-challenging economic climate. I'm delighted to introduce you to Andrew McKinley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Welcome to all of you in the room this morning and to all of you in the live stream. I suppose this is the time to tell those in the live stream that if you are watching on demand or plus one, do not vote. They may still be counted. So it won't be counted, but you may still be charged. I also want to thank uh, those that have managed to make it look like I've got quite a good golf swing, which you'll see on screen. But for those of you that have played golf with me, you'll be well aware that the more important thing to look for there is the angst look in my face as I see that ball going further right and further right and further right. So last year, I was sat at the back of the conference. I was sat over there somewhere. I just started off the recruitment process for the chief executive. And I was thinking to myself, what would it be like to be up there next year? Careful what you wish for. So last year, we heard about the challenges facing the game not unique to Scotland. And as with all challenges, there are huge opportunities. And that was very much the state of mind that I had as I left the conference last year and thought to myself, I want to be chief executive of that organization. So this year we will look forward. And as Emma said, there'll be an opportunity for you all to give feedback, ask questions through Slido. And as with last year, we will answer all of those questions post-conference that haven't been answered today. In addition, there'll be an opportunity for you to speak to members of the board and other members of the senior team, as well as myself, over lunch. But as always, days such as today are simply a snapshot in time, and the dialogue between yourselves and Scottish Golf is one that will continue. As Chief Executive, it's my role to lead Scottish Golf, 
And as part of this, I want to work with you, all our key stakeholders, to make the best decisions we can for the future of the game. They may not always be popular, but I can assure you that everything I do, and indeed everything my team does, will be done for the best intentions and for the future of the game in Scotland. Some of you in this room may have read the fantastic book, Legacy by James Kerr, which is all about the culture of the All Blacks. And for those that haven't read it, I highly recommend it. There's a lot we can learn from it. They believe firmly in many things, but one of the things they believe in is something called Waka Papa, the Maori phrase. And it means to be a good ancestor. And that is what we all must strive to be, as we are simply custodians of in the home of golf. So, I've been in the role for just over half the time since the last conference. It feels longer than that, but it is a month. I've spent a lot of time on the road, visiting events and visiting meetings in various areas and counties. As we mentioned there, we've also established our regional forums, a fantastic way for me to understand views from areas, counties and clubs. And today is essentially the third of these quarterly forums on a national basis, as we said we would when they were established. Finances are always going to be a key issue for any organisation. And I'm pleased to say that we have a very firm footing to allow us to deliver on our key objectives. I'm very well aware of how difficult the whole issue has been around the affiliation fee. And I want to personally give my thanks for, placing, for the membership for placing its faith in myself, the board and my team by voting through the affiliation fee increase. Rightly, we will be held to account for how we use this money. And I'm keen to give some insight today into what we are now able to do with that investment. In addition, a few weeks ago, myself, Eleanor, and other members of the senior team presented our forward uh, plans to Sports Scotland, in what was a very, very positive meeting. And I'm very hopeful that we'll hear in the new year that we now have a substantial four-year commitment from them. Of course, to deliver on all of this is not something that I can do on my own, and it's been important for me to build a team that can deliver on these key commitments. And I now have a really good senior team, as you heard about from Eleanor a minute ago. As you will also hear later, we have realigned our development team to ensure that they are best positioned to, develop, to deliver what our members require of them. Now, this is the only looking back I'm going to do in my presentation, because today is all about looking forward, as we now have a very stable base to build on, along with you and all the other key stakeholders of golf in Scotland. So when I came in, there were a number of things to look at, but it's very important for any organization to have a clear and simple vision and mission. Our vision could not be simpler. Scotland's game for everyone. Just think about that, Scotland's game. In the advert for the job that I now have, it talked about the job being an irresistible privilege. Also in one of my first interviews, I said that if this job is done properly, it is the best job in Scottish sport. And I genuinely believe that. And why is that? Because this is Scotland's game. We are in the home of golf. What a privilege that is. But it needs to be Scotland's game for everyone. Everyone, no matter gender, ethnicity, or social background. And I think we all know that we've got a long way to go in that regard. But what a massive untapped market. Our mission, as you can see on the screen, very clear as, as well, and we have a role as a governing body to strive for that. But all of us in this room and all of us who care about golf have a role to inspire all to love golf in all its forms, whether that be the new crazy golf at Brodick, which I was dragged around five times by my seven-year-old daughter recently, or a four-day, four 72-hole stroke play event over one of our many fine courses. We also need to contribute to a healthier, inclusive and aspirational Scotland. Health is a major issue in this country. Every week we hear about different stories. Just this week, it was about the ongoing obesity crisis in the young. And golf has a huge part to play in both the mental and the physical well-being 
of those in this country. So following last year's conference, the board and the senior team went away with all the feedback that they got and they used that to establish a strategy for the next four years. Those four years tie in with our Sports Scotland funding round. As Eleanor said, that strategy was launched at the AGM in March and on my arrival in May, I picked it up and I put some meat on the bones of it with the Scottish golf team. And as we move into the new financial year, we are now focusing on delivering the goals that underpin the three pillars of the strategy. So what is the first pillar? The first pillar, as you would expect, is all about growth of membership. But how are we going to do that? And that's what you'll hear a bit about today, about some of the many initiatives we have in this regard. One stat that I've probably heard more than any other since I joined Scottish Golf, and I'm constantly reminded of it, is that only 13% of our membership are women. That is not a percentage that it's new. It's been that for a long time, but it's not good enough. And this year saw the introduction of the Women and Golf Charter by the RNA, and we need to look at ways, as we all know, to make golf more attractive for women, but as I said earlier, for everyone. In relation to juniors, we always have a tendency to think we know what juniors want, as opposed to asking them. And in that regard, we have now set up our junior panel or a young person's panel, so that we can actually ask them what they want from golf, as opposed to assuming that we know. I certainly know how much I struggle to understand what my 15-year-old son wants, so why should the rest of us think that we know what they want? Let's just ask them. But fundamentally, at the root of the issue, we need to support clubs to be more welcoming, open and inclusive, to increase membership by encouraging all to join, and later you'll hear some great examples of where this has been successfully achieved. Turning to the second pillar of our strategy, as well as increasing participation, it's important that we work with clubs to help them increase their revenue, membership, and participation growth. To help us in this and to help us understand about what clubs were looking for, we carried out an insight exercise, which finished in September. And it was responded to by over 40% of the clubs in Scotland, which was great. And it gave us a really good understanding of the services that clubs wanted from us and on the back of that, we've now realigned our development team to deliver what is wanted. The danger in the past is that we maybe try to do too much and we want to focus more to allow us to deliver those areas that clubs want and where we can make the greatest difference. And you'll hear much more detail about these two pillars in the next session to be led by Ross Duncan. So turning to the third pillar of the strategy, improving finances. There's no doubt when I left here last year that probably the most challenging thing that was put to Scottish golf and where strong leadership was required was around this area. And you won't be surprised to know that much of my time since I came into the job has been spent working with our Chief Commercial Officer Ian Forsyth, who you'll hear from later. A particular challenge was laid down at last year's conference around our non-membership income and also around how we harnessed the wealth of the paper play golfers within the Scottish golf family. I'm sure you all know the phrase, but as Henry Ford said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. You don't turn a circa three and a half million business into a six plus million turnover, which is what we are looking to do in the next four years by getting a few sponsorship agreements here and there. You need to come up with something far more radical. As we're all aware, and as you heard starkly at last year's conference, society has changed and continues to change at a rapid pace. And the companies that have by far been the most successful are those that have disrupted the norm. And you'll know some example of these, and you'll hear more about that later. Within golf, the norm was disrupted a number of years ago in relation to the ability to easily get tee-off times online as a pay-per-play golfer. Many golf clubs embraced this for the right reasons, and for some, it has been very successful. However, as was highlighted last year, whilst the cost of golf club membership goes up, the cost of a round of golf has gone down significantly, and that is not a sustainable model. At the same time, significant amounts of money have left the game. 
I want to be very, very clear here. I'm not blaming anyone for this. And anyone that knows me at all knows that I believe very firmly in the free market as much as anyone else does. However, it's become very clear to me over the last six months that we have another major disruptor coming down the line facing the game. But this time we have an opportunity to get on the front foot. And to be clear, if we don't, others will. The biggest surprise to me since I started in this role is a number of commercial companies that want to work with Scottish Golf and want to profit from the game. So it's clear that the number of people playing the game is seen as a huge opportunity to these companies. Scottish Golf must be the leader here as we are not in this for commercial gain. On the contrary, we have a vested interest in the longevity of the game in this country. So to be clear, any and all money that we make will be reinvested for the good of the game in Scotland. So what is this disruptor? Well, it's quite clear. It's the handicap, and in particular, the availability of the handicap to pay per play golfers. With the fast approaching introduction of the world handicapping system, I'm aware of a number of commercial organizations that are looking at this space and see it as a huge opportunity. I'm also aware of legal challenges to the current handicap system in GB&I, and I'm aware of other countries who have already provided handicaps to pay per play golfers. For example, in New Zealand, two thirds of those who have taken those handicaps have never been members of golf clubs. And of the other third, most of them have not been members of golf clubs for years. There are also other countries far closer to home that are looking at this. And indeed, for those of you that don't know already, there are a number of golf clubs in Scotland who are already providing handicap only memberships effectively for the play-per-play -play golfer. At the moment, membership of golf clubs in Scotland makes up appro approximately 21% of those who golf in Scotland, but contributes the majority of the money to the maintenance of the clubs and courses. I don't believe this is right, and we need to ensure that we bring the pay-per-play golfers into our fold in a manner that will bring significant revenue into the game. One of the ways to achieve this is for these golfers to have handicaps, but more importantly, for them to pay to play our courses to get those handicaps. But we need to take control of that. As I've said, if we don't, others will, and we will be left with a job of managing the decline of the game in its home country something that I'm sure none of you want to do, and I certainly don't. It's important to be clear though at this point, this is not simply the least bad option with us doing this as opposed to others who will do it in any case. There are a number of advantages which Ian will look at later on in his session. It's important for me to, to, to stress the point. I understand the stresses and strains that clubs are facing and in particular those faced by, amongst others, club managers and volunteers who are the bedrock of our game. We believe that what we are looking to introduce and offer to clubs will help make their lives easier and will also assist in growing the game and bringing significant potential revenue that clubs would not otherwise have had. It's also very important to note that clubs will remain in control of their courses and who plays their courses. They won't be forced to welcome pay-per-play golfers with handicaps. However, as with all challenges and change, there is a great opportunity and clubs should see these golfers as a significant source of additional income. Another great advantage of the system that we're bringing in is on the data side. I've often been challenged around the one affiliation P point and bringing in the new system will allow us to have the necessary information to properly consider the issue of golfers only paying one affiliation fee, even if members of several clubs. This will lessen the money that some clubs have to pay and could also be used as a discount by others to encourage new members who are members of other clubs. Also, if we can raise the sort of money that I am sure we can, it will give us far greater flexibility for our financial model into the future. 
This is a potentially transformational project for the game in Scotland. And it's one that all of us in Scottish golf are very excited about. And you will hear much more about it in this afternoon's session. And I'm very hopeful that you will leave here sharing the excitement that we all have for the future of the game in this country. Just to finish off from me, as well as focusing on these pillars and spending much of my time out and about listening to those involved in golf in Scotland, I've also attended a number of events this year and have seen some of the great talent that's coming through the amateur ranks. In particular, I would like to mention the two Hannahs, Darling and McCook. You'll see pictured there Hannah Darling, who won the inaugural RNA Under 16 Girls Open at the age of 14. And Hannah McCook won back-to-back -back weeks in the Irish and Welsh Opens. 2018 also saw Shannon McWilliam represent Scotland in the GBNI team at the Curtis Cup. On the men's side, amongst other things, Sam Locke, pictured there, won the silver medal at Carnoustie, and Ryan Lumsden qualified to play in the US Open at Shinnecock Hills. No mean feat. We still have a role to play in creating champions who will be role models for future generations and golfers. And from my perspective, the standout achievement this past year has been that of the men on the Challenge Tour, with some great tournament wins and, of course, four Scottish graduates to the full European Tour. And as I'm sure some of you have seen overnight, they continue to be very successful on the full tour. So I'd like to leave you with a short video celebrating their success. Thank you. the absolute world to me. I mean, going from uh, having absolutely no status at the start of the year and just playing off uh, invitations, I mean, to now win my third tournament on the Challenge Tour, I'm just absolutely ecstatic and I can't wait for the rest of the year ahead. It's going to be exciting. After, well, this is my fifth season on the Challenge Tour and I've never won yet. Um, so to do it on a week when everybody's here and everybody's watching, um, you know, I can take so much confidence from it and, um, yeah, no, it's just so pleasing. And this is just surreal. I don't know how it's happened, or, um, but I feel very fortunate, very lucky and uh, thankful. Oh, I can't even imagine this was going to happen starting the year in January um, with the goals that I'd set myself to be now in such a good position on the Order of Merit here. To have this one and still events to go, it's just nice to um, just try and keep pushing myself up the board and um, see how high I can finish in the, the rankings. Thank you very much to Andrew there and to Eleanor for earlier on. And uh, I think we would all agree in the room, we're immensely proud of all of the young golfers from the Challenge Tour stepping up there to the European Tour. And we wish them the very best of luck for the, the forthcoming campaign, which has already started, actually, no rest for them. But as Andrew pointed out, creating positive role models is still so much a part of what needs to be done here in Scotland. And we're very lucky that over the years we have had those positive role models. And it's great to see that we're still continuing to produce them to inspire the next generation. So following on from that, it gives me great pleasure to pass over to Ross Duncan, who is the Development Director. And this is to find out a bit more about the changes Scottish golf have been making within the club's support system since last year's conference, and also some of the new initiatives that are being launched in response to feedback from the members and the clubs. Please welcome Ross. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Ross Duncan, Development Director for Scottish Golf, as Emma said, and I formally took on this role back in May this year. Um, appreciate it's a hugely challenging task trying to, to grow the game and build stronger clubs, but I certainly wouldn't have taken on the challenge had I thought I couldn't make a difference. As Andrew said, we want to leave the game in a better position than the one we inherited, and that's hopefully something that everybody in this room who's involved in running golf clubs in Scotland can relate to. Uh, I have to say I get slightly offended when I read on social media, probably shouldn't read social media, that uh, people involved in running Scottish golf aren't in touch with the, with the grassroots of the game. Uh, I've been a member of my own club for, I think, 32 years. No, I don't look old enough. Uh, I've been on the committee for, I think, 12 years, uh, and I'm currently the marketing convener and the club captain at my home club of Peebles Golf Club. I also help out as a level one volunteer coach, uh, teaching or helping teach kids on a, on a Sunday morning and try and play in quite a few competitions as well. So very much in touch with it, with the grassroots of the club and, and fully appreciate what, what life is like trying to run a, a golf club in the current climate. I think I'm also the, the only club captain uh, at Peebles that there's been or possibly in Scotland who's done their club championship presentation in their flip-flops and a pair of shorts uh, as I did this summer. Uh, it was 28 degrees after all, for those of you who can remember back to the, the long hot summer uh, that, that we had in Scotland. And I guess at Peebles we pitch ourselves as, as quite a kind of relaxed, family-friendly club. So I thought, got my flip-flops on, why not? And I felt it was a good message to say that we have a, a relaxed dress code. So hopefully I can speak uh, from experience as someone who's been there, worn the t-shirt and indeed the shorts. Uh, I'm very proud to be part of working as a volunteer in a golf club, particularly one that's grown its membership in each of the last five years. We, we too had very challenging times, but we've turned the club around by focusing on the junior and youth uh, element. And we've, we've grown our youth and junior membership from 60 to its current level of, uh, of over 150. Um, up on the screen, you'll see an image. I put a tweet out uh, from my own golf club at the start of the, the season showing our new clubhouse rules. It's probably slightly different to most rules posters you might see at a golf club. Uh, it certainly seemed to capture the imagination of the, of the golf industry and indeed was shared by over 150 people and, and, and over 10,000 engagements. The message was really to encourage people to smile when they go to the golf club rather than moan and groan. I'm sure everybody in this room has seen it, but you know, golf is a fantastic sport, one that we should all enjoy, but I think too often we, we can go into the, the, the game or the clubhouse with a negative attitude, have a moan at the committee, and we talk it down rather than kind of talking it up. But hopefully some of the message that you'll, you'll hear from us today will, will certainly change that. It's certainly great to see so many people in the room here today that are eager to embrace change and make your clubs better. To be a strong club, uh, it takes bravery and bold decisions, as Eleanor said, a good business plan, but it also takes very hardworking and dedicated people, and many of you are here today. Going that extra mile, putting in the extra hours, and being that, that change is vital. As Andrew alluded to earlier, um, we, we did some, some insights projects over, over the summer period, uh, and we engaged with over 40% of our golf clubs in Scotland, with 235 clubs responding to our many phone calls. This was on the back of feedback that we got at last year's conference, and we've got a pretty good uh, sample size to start with, and that, that's very encouraging for us. Also encouraging was the number of clubs uh, that, that said they were aware of our club services at 85%, and 85% sorry, said that the, the services that we provide were beneficial, comprehensive, very good, or helpful. And that, that's very encouraging to see that our, our support is moving in the right direction. But which club services did, did the clubs use? Not surprisingly, handicapping came out on top at just under 80%, and it's great that that service, uh, the team run by Callum Grant in our office, is, 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 is really valued by the clubs. But it would, however, be good to see some, some clubs using some of the wider services, and you can see on the graph there just, just how kind of that, that falls away quickly. And, and while handicapping is important, uh, it doesn't necessarily pay the bills. And it was slightly disappointing that our recent resource efficiency seminars that, that we had scheduled for, for last month, uh, we actually had to cancel two. And this is something that we were pitching to help clubs save money. We actually ran a pilot seminar at Ochterarda Golf Club back in the summer with our partners at Resource Efficiency Scotland, which led to some clubs making savings of around £3,000 a year purely on lighting energy. On an average, a, a club who's worked with us in this area can expect to make savings of £10,000. For any club interested in tapping into this excellent resource that we have, I would be delighted to introduce you to my colleague Carolyn Headley in her uh, expert area of that field. 
We're certainly not going to scrimp on handicapping, however, and indeed we'll be staging a number of seminars this spring to help clubs with a transition into the new worldwide handicapping system, which will be upon us in 2020. And there will be further online training for those who can't attend on, on those seminars. The next highest ranking service was safeguarding, and something that's really important if you're to take junior golf development at your club seriously. And that rated at about 60% of the clubs using that. This is an often unseen area of the governing body's work, but it's hugely important that we all take it seriously. And indeed, Scottish Golf prides itself on the great service that we provide golf clubs, and we're he held very highly in the regard of Sports Scotland as a result of the service we deliver in this area. To date, we've processed over 600 PVG applications this year, and almost 1,800 in total over the last three years. And our thanks go to Gavin Forrester and uh, Andrew Travers for their work in this area. So what else have clubs told us? Part, part of the survey was really getting feedback on clubs for what else they wanted to see from us, and communication ranked up there pretty highly. This is something we're often accused of not, not doing a good job on, uh, but we are working hard behind the scenes on a new website, and we've recently appointed Cameron McClay, who's at the back of the room today, as our new com uh, communications manager to lead the work on our new communication strategy. We do invest significant resource in our e-newsletters, social media, and mainstream media, but we've got to get better at gauging with our clubs to promote the services through these marketing channels. As you'll see from the feedback, there's also a perception that perhaps we don't provide enough support for the smaller clubs. This is certainly not our intent, and we do have numerous case studies to illustrate where our support can benefit some of those more remote clubs, particularly in the Highlands, as you'll hear about in our club panel later on. A further suggestion on a similar theme was to make our education seminars more accessible to the whole country, because these were seen as being too far away for some of the more remote clubs. Whilst we try and cover every part of the country, it's not always feasible, uh, and we are looking at ways in which we can bring remote learning opportunities through our workshop uh, programmes over the coming year, and we'll talk about that shortly as well. Looking at further improvements, uh, better promotion of golf clubs through our marketing channels was something that was asked for, and there was probably a, a feeling that we sometimes promoted some of the bigger clubs instead of the smaller clubs, and that's something we're very keen to change and improve on through our new digital platform, which will be available to every single golf club who's affiliated with us. Whilst, whilst greater interaction with the paper play golfers also came up regularly through our feedback, again, a component of Ian's uh, update later on. One other suggestion was tiered uh, education so that we can design our tools that are fit for purpose, both for big clubs, small clubs, and everybody else in between. And I ran a, a series of digital marketing uh, seminars last year uh, covering social media, digital marketing, and everything that goes with that, with more than 100 clubs attending. But the variance in knowledge between marketing conveners at those clubs was pretty stark. So it is very important that we try and bring uh, education to everybody who needs it, no matter their level of ability. And with the marketing background that I have, I see marketing and communication support for golf clubs as a vital part of our business planning service going forward. Another suggestion uh, that we, we took from clubs from the, the feedback was a nine-hole junior competition. And this was really on the back of a hugely successful nine-hole championship that we ran with the RNA earlier on this season, and hopefully many clubs in this room were involved. There's been a lot of talk about the shorter format of the game, with nine-hole competitions coming to the fore. And we were delighted that over 270 clubs entered our qualifying event this year. Such, to the de such was the demand that we had to actually extend our final over two days at Milnathort in the summer instead of one. The shorter format has been around for, for a long time. I, I grew up playing nine holes a lot. I, I play six holes a lot with my son. I just don't think golf's been particularly good at telling the wider world that it exists. We already have our version of 2020 cricket, and I will go on to talk about an exciting new nine, uh, six hole initiative for juniors later on. Moving on to equality, again, something Andrew touched upon, and this is a hugely important part of our work going forward. We asked clubs just about how, how well positioned they were for, for the provision of golf to, to men and women. And not surprisingly, uh, it highlighted that many women across the country don't have the same playing opportunities as their male counterparts, particularly with access to tee-off times on peak days and in particular Saturday. Two-thirds of golf clubs still have separate competition days for men and women, whilst 84% had Saturdays as the main competition days for men, Disappointingly, only 57% ran competitions on Saturdays for women. 
If clubs are really genuine about wanting to attract more women into the game, particularly younger working women, we have to ensure that both genders can play equally on a Saturday, which might be the only time a busy working woman can play golf or indeed a busy working man. I would say this, this requires significant attitude and culture shift. And I, I read about one club on Twitter uh, last week who were advertising their ladies club AGM that was taking place at 10.30 a.m. on Monday morning. So unless that club was offering Skype facilities, I don't suppose many working women were having their say at that particular club. Thankfully, it wasn't in Scotland. So within our strategy, we have a target of increasing female membership in Scotland by 33% over the next four years. It's actually only 12 golfers per club or 12 new women per club. But to achieve that, we have to work collectively on that to address inequality within golf clubs. So I've talked to you about what, what the feedback's been, uh, and we've made a lot of changes uh, on the back of that feedback. So I'm just going to take you through some slides on, on what we have done. A key element of the feedback was, was providing more expertise within the organization, particularly when it comes, comes to club development. And whilst the club development officers have been a, doing a great job out on the road, over the last couple of years, they've been lacking in fresh resources and new toolkits to take out to clubs that are built in the head office. There's been an element of being reactive rather than proactive or firefighting rather than coming up with a new solution. So the key changes that we've got reflect some of that feedback. We've looked at the development team structure and there's been no increase in the headcount, but we've realigned people based on, on their expertise within the organization, focusing on six core areas of support with three new roles created within the team. We've also merged our regional club development officer team with our schools and communities officers to create a pool of seven regional club development officers to work out in the field. And while these posts will be very much focused on our, our clubs being, being club centric, there will still be a role for the team to play in helping clubs forge link with schools and local communities so they can feed some of that, that pipeline of young people into the game. But our focus is very much going to be on, on you, the clubs. So who are the new team? We have some of them in the room today. The light's a bit bright up here, but I'll, uh, I'll ask them to stand up as I, I announce them. Uh, leading on our, our club business uh, work is Ian Evans. Ian's the most experienced of our club development officers. And Ian's work's going to be focused on governance, business planning, marketing, membership recruitment, member forums, and customer service, whilst also working alongside Ian on the new digital platform. Gavin Forrester moves to the role of junior development manager. And Gavin has the, the not so small remit of building a new national junior framework in Scotland that I'll, I'll touch upon later on working closely with our partners at the PGA, working on safeguarding and those school to club links that I've mentioned. We appointed a new women and girls officer, uh, women and girls development manager at the start of the year, Carol Harvey, focusing on the women's game. And I'll, I'll talk about Car Carol's role in more detail later on. And the three people that we have existing within the team, Carolyn Headley, whose role covers all aspects of how golf clubs can cope with climate change, looking at sustainability, resource efficiency, and the many environmental aspects of running a golf club. Callum Grant leads the work on, on handicapping and course rating, as I mentioned, overseeing all that, that, that really technical work, helping with course rating training. And we rate an average of 70 to 80 clubs a year, and I'd like to thank the, the volunteers that help Callum do that work, particularly at the moment where we're re-rating tees for every gender and the growth of the nine hole uh, ratings as well. And finally, overseeing the, the regional development team is Mandy Ma Martin. Many of you will know Mandy from her, her role as a regional club development officer. Mandy will still continue to, to work with a few clubs in Edinburgh, but her responsibility is making sure that we get the best out of the regional club development team. So onto the regional team itself, and, and these, these people will work very closely with our central team to take our, our work out to the people at the coalface to try and make a difference, covering all parts of Scotland. As I said earlier, we have seven. We have an average of 80 club relationships to manage. But each of our, our development officers is going to be tasked with providing uh, support to every affiliated golf club in Scotland who needs it with a tailored support package using the core services that we provide. We have three new people within that team that have moved from the schools and communities roles. Anne Lang, who many of you will know down in the southwest, Fraser Crawford, covering Perth and Kinross and Fife, and Martin Ritchie, who's working in the northeast. Each of these three uh, people have great experience of working in the development of junior golf in their previous roles and have great knowledge of the inner workings of, of clubs. They've, they've all served on club committees as well, or supported club committees. 
As a comparison, England Golf has 32 club support officers, but we are working very hard to get our offering right to clubs and providing training for our staff so that they can go out and deliver the best possible service to you. Joining Willie Mackay in the Highlands, Leslie Nicholson down in the southeast, Sean Laird in the west, and Craig Chammers, who covers the Glasgow and surrounding area. Moving on to one of our more exciting new initiatives that we launched this year, and that was the Club Buying Group. Uh, unfortunately, Ian Howison, who, who works with us on that, has, has called off today. I would have asked Ian to stand up at this juncture, uh, but I think he's got a sickness bug. Probably too much travelling around the country. Uh, but we launched this back at AGM in March, really on the back of previous feedback that we'd had for clubs, asking if we could help them procure key su supplier categories uh, and, and save money. So we chose GMG as our partners who've got great experience in working in this sector, and we've been working on that since March. The buying group harnesses the collective purchasing power of our golf clubs. And with 578 potential customers, we can really work those suppliers hard to get savings for our clubs. It's an opt-in service, but we now have 184 different golf clubs registered in Scotland. And to date, we, we, have, totally, we have savings aggregating over £178,000 and projected year one savings for those clubs who do sign up between three and four thousand pounds per year in year one. Key categories include gas and electricity and what is a very challenging marketplace at, at the moment. But again, we have some great examples of clubs saving money in this area. We also have waste management, food procurement, telecoms, washroom services, score, scorecard printing and other areas. And the buying group really is for everybody from large clubs such as Royal Troon to a small club such as Campsie and everything in between. Ian sent, me some on, Ian sent on some fantastic examples uh, where clubs have saved significant money recently. Largs in the west and Afford in the northeast have both benefited from our food procurement uh, savings with £6,900 and £4,000 respectively for this year. The Herschel down in the borders have saved over £3,000 on a recent electricity bill and Campsie, who I mentioned, have saved over £1,500 across three different categories. Another one is Lamlash Golf Club, who made a 57% saving on their previous telecom bills. I think as well as saving money, the buying group is also designed to help the club managers and volunteers save time. We have an innovative, innovative contracts manager platform, which is a great tool that helps alert you when your contracts are up for renewals. I think we've all spent endless hours at night looking at our own price comparison sites for our own electricity and gas. But this, this system really takes the pain away from doing that so that you as a club manager can focus on other key parts of your business. And for any club not involved in that already, please do contact Ian or your, your regional club development officer. Education was also one of the key themes that came through from our feedback, and we've been working very hard at new ways of looking at how we provide education to our golf clubs. Looking at club managers, volunteers, PGA professionals, and other people involved with running a golf club. And whilst there's significant value in face-to-face -face training and networking between clubs, we do appreciate that not everyone has the time or ability to travel to the nearest workshop. To that end, as you'll see on the screen, we've been trialing an online classroom this is nothing new given the technology that's now available in this, in this uh, area. But we want to find the best solution that can be applicable for everyone. And Gavin has run a series of safeguarding workshops using the Adobe Connect platform. And we've had over 50 delegates from 37 clubs taking part in that with great feedback. So it does work. Online learning is something we're very keen to develop over the next year. And indeed, for those of you who have been at the recent rules seminars, there is an online element to them so that you can take the video presentation back to your club or go and look through it if you've not managed to go along to one of the seminars. Clearly, Scottish Golf aren't and can't be the experts in everything that we provide on the education front. Um, but we do try and work with, with other people that we, that we can uh, turn to. Uh, there's lots of experts out in the golf industry that we work with, and we are very keen to forge stronger relationships with a number of, of other governing bodies, including the RNA, the Scottish Golf Club Managers Association, on the greenkeeping front, BEGA, the PGA, Sports Scotland, and Visit Scotland, as well as working more closely with the various local authorities who play a vital role in operating a large number of courses across Scotland, and you'll hear from someone involved in that in our club panel. 
We're particularly pleased to be working closer with the Scottish Golf Club Managers Association again and providing subsidies to the smaller clubs who, who want to put their club managers through the MDP programme that makes it more affordable. And this support can be accessed via your regional club officer. It's fair to say, I think, that any, any member of staff or club manager that's gone through the training has come out the other end doing a, a better job and making a positive impact on running their club. Another area we're working closely with the RNA on is, is golf and health, as Andrew mentioned, and, and we're delighted that the RNA are investing so much resource and money in this area to, to really raise the many benefits uh, that, that golf can provide and, and health and well-being. We want to make sure that the wider world knows about this as well, and it's vital that the RNA continue to spread the message globally so that non-golfers can hear the messages. There's been significant academic research done in this field, particularly by Edinburgh University and Dr. Andrew Murray, who you may have heard about, highlighting the many benefits associated with, with playing golf. And this is something we're very keen to promote to, to older people, to keep people playing for longer and to keep people within the game. Collectively, I think we need to do a better job at telling the world that golf is good for you. And we're going to be working on our own national communication campaign next year to highlight these messages for you to take back to your local club and local community to spread the word. People who play golf regularly can expect to live five years longer than those who don't. Regular golf decreases the risk of anxiety, depression, and dementia. Playing golf also decreases the risk of 40 different chronic diseases. And, and golf is also shown to have confidence, self-worth, and self-esteem benefits, although not if you four-putt the 18th. <laughs> so look out for more information on golf and health. This really is going to be one of the key uh, areas of work going forward, particularly as we work more closely with the RNA on this front. And there's lots of information on the RNA website. So as well as giving, taking money from you, we're happy to say that we also give money back to you. And we launched the Regional Club Development Fund earlier on this year. And this is really designed to support clubs with a number of sustainable projects, ranging from training and education, marketing, coach development, and facility improvement, where we match fund some of the money put in by clubs. And over the past six months, a total of 15,000 pounds has been invested in the Club Development Fund. Uh, with our own regional club development officers working on clubs on particular projects to make a difference to the long-term success of that club. We also use the evaluation that we get from clubs involved in this to, to share best practice and hopefully encourage other clubs to follow some of those projects. And today we're pleased to say 38 different clubs benefited from this in 2018 and we're going to be significantly increasing the funding available as part of that affiliation fee uplift uh, into next year with a particular support uh, focus on, on smaller clubs. One such club to benefit, if you look on the screen this year, has been McDonald Ellen Golf Club in the Northeast, and I think Mike Morris from the club is, is here today. So well done, Mike, on achieving some great results. Uh, Mike and his team up at uh, McDonald Ellen worked with our regional club development officer at the time, Ian Evans, and the club engaged his services to put together an open day planning, uh, planning session with the objective of driving membership and supporting the growth of their Get Into Golf program, which they'd already started. One of Ian's specialist areas is open day planning, and hopefully you'll hear more about him uh, in the open day planning module that we're going to be working on next year. And he's done a number of uh, club projects in his time on this front. And Ian helped the committee up, uh, up with Mike through a, a planning session for open days using the module that he'd created. However, we can do only do so much to help, and it required the commitment of the club's volunteers and the team up at McDonald Island to stage a very successful uh, open day in the summer, which, as you may have read in, in our uh, marketing channels, generated no fewer than 66 new members this year, of which included 24 females and 18 juniors. In addition, their Get Into Golf programme has gone from strength to strength, with 25 women now taking part in the introductory golf sessions. That's a great example of what can be achieved working with Scottish Golf uh, and the vision of a club committee. So again, well done to Mike and his team up there. On top of the Club Development Fund, we're also delighted to be working in partnership with the Golf Foundation and HSBC. And we were given a grant of £50,000 to invest in junior club projects this year when we launched the, the project at Carnoustie this summer. That's a fantastic amount of money and is going to be spread across different clubs with up to 500 or 750 pounds available per club to reward those clubs who successfully put together a pathway for junior membership between school and clubs. And this will be available to the first 87 clubs who take it up. 
The HSBC Golf Roots Project Fund will support different projects which help clubs grow their junior section. And again, we're looking at a number of different criteria for this. And this could be junior coaching, training for pros and indeed volunteers, new equipment for kids, facility improvement or marketing. This was launched earlier this year. It's going to be available till the end of March. And I'd like to thank Brendan Pyle and his team at the Golf Foundation for helping to make this happen. And I really would urge any club who's not been involved in this so far to get in touch again with your regional club development officer. There's lots of information on the website as well. Sticking with the theme of juniors and, and probably the biggest area of discussion I've had in my time during this new role has been the challenges that we all face uh, recruiting more young people into the game. We're certainly not alone in this regard, and some of these challenges are faced by all different sports and indeed many other governing bodies as we all try and stay relevant to Generation Y, the millennials, and the young team, as the boys in the office call it. There are some great stories, however, to come from clubs up and down the country who've been building successful junior programs, and we want to talk more about them as we go around the country trying to get the best insights from people. Great examples of clubs who work with local schools. Heard one this morning from, from Jason Boyd at Montrose, improving the junior facilities and making their clubs more attractive to young people. And while we're st still to find that elusive magic wand, we believe there are a combination of factors that do contribute to a successful junior programme, supported by, but importantly not dictated to, your national governing body. And I think as we discussed last year, We've, meant le we've learnt many lessons from the, the successful club or the success of some aspects of club golf. And whilst it might not have been the transformational change it set out to, it has resulted in some significant changes to the junior golf landscape in Scotland. I think on the whole, clubs are generally better equipped to look after young people. Traditionally, there was only one junior convener with not a lot of support around them. And we now have junior section with a number of volunteers helping out. I think attitudes in general have improved towards young people and we now see that golf is still played in schools uh, and many facilities have been improved to, to be more appealing to, to kids. There's been some great initiatives up and down the country as well and really I want to highlight the fantastic work done by the Paul Laurie Foundation in the Northeast and the Stephen Gallagher Foundation in, in the Southeast and we've been having ongoing discussions with them as to how they go about their work. I would have loved to have stood up here today and talked about a shiny new uh, national junior framework that we're going to be launching, but these things take time, but I think we are progressing behind the scenes. We've certainly not been standing still, and the work on this front is being led by Gavin Forrester, who I mentioned earlier, gathering insights and also updating some of the resources so that we still have an offering to give to clubs in the interim. One of the initial pieces of work that Gavin's been doing is developing a series of regional forums that we're going to be doing in the spring inviting PGA pros and junior conveners from across Scotland, those with the, with the best experience at working with kids at their clubs, with the aim of sharing best practice insights and looking at how we can start to build that framework using examples of what's being done already, a bit like taking the best bits from what's out there. I think it's evident that, that not one size fits all, and again, speaking to a few pros over recent months, they, they, all, they all do things in a, in a kind of slightly different way, but there's a lot of commonality within that, a lot of factors that shine through, as, as, as we can see up on the screen. Uh, making golf fun, I think, is something that's very important, and that's, that's just not on, on the golf course, it's within the clubhouse as well. Engaging with parents, keeping it affordable and accessible, we've talked about. I think integrating with membership as soon as possible is key to retaining youngsters in your golf club. Good communication and marketing is absolutely vital, as we know now, and that's not just social media. And also having PGA pros very much at the heart of your club or working with a roving pro for those clubs who've not, who aren't fortunate enough to have their own pro, as well as being supported by a team of volunteers. Safeguarding is another vital issue, and I don't think you can run a junior golf programme without going through all the various stag stages of that. But if you put all these things in the melting pot, you can start to see what a successful programme looks like. Enhance it digitally. You can engage with more kids. Partner up with your local school. You can reach more kids. And embrace your local community, as we've seen, and you can reach more families. So we look forward to developing some of this work as a, one of our really major priority projects going forward. Again, something else that Andrew touched upon is one of our exciting new initiatives that we've launched recently, the Young Persons Golf Panel. And I'm really pleased that this is, uh, this is now taking off. We launched this last month, inviting people, young people aged between 14 and 23 with a passion for golf or sport to get involved. 
It's all very well asking people from golf club committees to tell us what they think. But as Andrew said, we really don't have a clue at times what youngsters are thinking these days, as we're using Facebook and they're using Snapchat. A bit like Tom Hanks in the film Big, for those of you who can remember back to the early 80s, where the Macmillan Toy Company invited him to design their next range of toys after they advised him that the current offering that the adults came up with just wouldn't sell. Collectively, the golf industry, I think, in general, hasn't been great at asking youngsters, so we're now going to start that process. We're all arguing over dress codes, as we've touched upon earlier, but these kids are living lives in tracksuit bottoms and jazzy leggings, so I think some of these attitudes really have to change, and we want that to be driven back by young people. Our work's been led by Sports Scotland, and they've been working with a number of governing bodies who've set up their own young people's panels, comprising of youngsters who want to have an in, uh, input into their sport. Scot Sports Scotland themselves have had their own panel up and running for a number of years ago, and Andrew and I were privileged enough to attend a conference a couple of weeks ago in Glasgow, and we were blown away by, by the quality of the presentations delivered by the young people. They actually ran their own national conference last month, some of you may have seen it on social media, called Lead the Way, bringing youngsters together to create ideas, share practice and develop their skills. And wouldn't it be great for us to stand here next year with some of those young people speaking about the work they've been doing over the past 12 months. We often hear of clubs complaining that they can't attract young people onto the committee, and indeed I was accused recently of leading a young clique of 40-year-olds on, on my committee. I certainly ain't young anymore. Um, so we are building our own young people's panel. We had a, a third of applicants were female, and we're currently shortlisting and interviewing candidates with the, with the aim of starting our work in January. One of my ambitions for this would be to have a young person, a young ambassador represented in every club in Scotland, and even having a young persons panel at every club in Scotland. 2018 has been the year of young people, and I think we should embrace that and build a legacy for it. Some of the stories I heard at that, that Sports Scotland conference would suggest that young people are really, really keen to get involved in supporting sport and committees across the country, whether golf or, or any other sport. Um, whether that's for work experience, building up their own CVs, or putting applications in for, for further education. And we've got a massive market out there of young people who can help fill some of the gaps on our committees or work closely with our, our club managers. Uh, another initiative, keep talking about initiatives here, but we have been quite busy. Uh, we launched this in 2018 again in partnership with the Golf Foundation was our Box of Tricks workshop. And hopefully some of the people in the room I know have been at uh, some of the seminars that we did. The Box of Tricks, I'll, I'll show it here for anyone who's not seen it, is literally a box of tricks. And it's really a, a bunch of ideas aimed at clubs uh, trying, to, trying to retain members, uh, junior members at their own club. It touches upon a little bit of coaching, but it's really focused on some of the off-course work that you can do at your club, uh, such as family engagement, uh, junior member nights, all designed to make junior golf club membership more appealing to kids and their families all year round. Initially, we staged a, a, a series of nine workshops across Scotland in the autumn, but they really caught the imagination of junior conveners, club managers, and those involved in junior golf, so much so that we had to add a further five workshops to our total. Uh, we had 217 delegates across 140 different clubs in attendance, and all our seven regional club development officers have been trained to deliver these. So if there is demand out there still, if you've not been involved in doing this, we would really encourage you to, to speak to your club development officer and see if we can put one on in your area. The proof of the pudding, obviously, will be to see what work, is, what work gets done, but, but some of the enthusiasm, certainly leaving some of those workshops, would suggest there's going to be an awful lot of work uh, going to be taking place at clubs over the coming months to plan uh, how they're going to attract and retain junior members over the next year. Another uh, project we've been working on with the Golf Foundation uh, was the, the Junior Golf Sixes, and this is a, a great initiative that's had some real success already throughout the UK. Uh, working with Leslie in the, in the South East and Mandy in West Lothian, uh, we ran two pilot Junior Sixes leagues uh, on the back, really, of the successful European Tour Golf Sixes event. The Golf Sixes leagues are designed to give competitive opportunities to young golfers coming up through their club ranks, not necessarily those who, who are members of have handicaps, but give them the chance to, to play for your local team. Obviously in golf, it's slightly different to team sports, such as football and rugby, but the golf sixes is designed to be an exciting, fun part of the game and to give you that thrill of pulling on your club jersey or club shirt and representing your, your club. We've taken it down to, to six holes, obviously, uh, playing in a two-person scramble and using different scoring method that, that makes it easier for kids to get involved. The Golf Foundation generally, provides, uh, generously provide clothing for the teams and merchandise so that every club 
has got a different coloured shirt, a bit like 2020 cricket. And outside of this, this pilot, we've also seen a couple of clubs in Ayrshire come up with their own names for the junior sections, the Barassi Bashers, the Barassi and the Little Nicks at Presswick, just two of them. And that's something we would encourage all clubs to, to do as they get involved in the junior sixes next year. Results from the UK uh, pilot last year, or this year, sorry, saw a 34% increase in junior membership from the clubs that were involved. So it's certainly something that has a tangible result at the end. The feedback was, was really, really positive. We've just had the report in from the Golf Foundation yesterday. And we're now with, working with them to make some tweaks, improve the format, and roll this out on a national basis next year. We're also in discussions with the organizers of the Solheim Cup. And I think if we speak to David Connor, who is here today nicely, there might be the chance that we can stage a national junior sixes final at Glen Eagles next September, which would be an amazing experience for, for the youngsters. So watch this space and please encourage your club to get involved. So speaking of the Solheim Cup, we've obviously touched upon women and girls development and the work we've been doing in this area. And this again has really been a major focus for Scottish golf this year. We are very grateful to the RNA and the Solheim Cup 2019 team for co-funding a new role at the start of this year with Carol Harvey joining as our Women and Young People Development Manager. Carol joined from Scottish Netball, and netball is indeed the fastest growing sport in the UK. So Carol's bringing some of her learnings and expertise from that sport into helping us grow female participation and membership. And while we can use the Solheim Cup as a platform next year, our work really needs to go beyond that. And we can hopefully ensure that women and girls are, the, are at the heart of the Scottish golf strategy for years to come. From the conference last year, we're all very aware of the importance of engaging more women in the game. And we do have that stat that only 13% of our female, of our membership is female. We're working hard on, on developing further our, our national get into golf program aimed at adult beginners across the country. And this does deliver positive results for the clubs who've embraced it. Scottish Golf provides clubs with marketing and coaching resources to support your club. And again, we've had some really good examples of clubs who've embraced this. Elgin Golf Club have had 60 women signed up to the initial coaching program with 28 taking up an introductory membership offer. And, all and they have had five now fully involved in full membership, taking their membership of females to over 100. Glen Course Golf Club, just down the road from here, had 46 women attend a, an open evening uh, earlier on this summer with 42 moving into their Get Into Golf uh, group coaching sessions. And they've had 15 new full members taking part, and that's a massive increase on where they were before. And in the heart of the country, Milner Thorpe Golf Club, I mentioned earlier, have added 25 new females into their Get Into Golf program, all, all full members. And you'll hear shortly about some of the work at Douglas Parks. Uh, uh, get into golf, an innovative get into golf program, and Anne Scott joins us on the club panel. I lost a slide here. Anyway, you can listen to me and still look at the screen. Um, some of the research we, we've had from get into golf is that the, the, a lot of the women coming into to get into golf that are new to golf don't, don't necessarily want to play golf in the more traditional format, and we've seen some great examples of clubs putting forward some different membership categories such as buddy systems, shortened formats of, of competitive golf, and different things being adapted for this demographic. And putting in Prosecco night seemed to be a hugely popular uh, event for this particular demographic. So again, that's something that I would encourage many clubs to do. I think we had 40 at my own golf club doing this, the power of Prosecco. So Carol's leading the work in this area and currently developing new resources to work on with our clubs so that we can make the most of the Solheim Cup opportunity. It's certainly not going to happen overnight and some of the challenges that we face is the outside world's perception towards golf and that it's a very stuffy, male-dominated and traditional game because that's what they read in the media. To counteract that, we worked with England Golf, Wales Golf and Ireland Golf on the Women and Girls Golf Week uh, that was squeezed in between the Aberdeen Standard Investments Ladies Scottish Open at Gullen and the Rico Women's British Open at Royal Lytham. And this was a fantastic social media campaign that we all worked together on and created some excellent results. We worked with a number of high profile women who are involved in the golf industry, such as TV presenters Diane Knox and Ailey Barber. PGA pros, Elsa Murphy and Katie McNichol, social media star, the jazzy golfer, hopefully she's watching online today, as well as showcasing the great work of many female volunteers who are involved in working in the grassroots of the game in Scotland. And I know some of them are here today. Carol Fell, Mary Richardson and Yvonne Dixon were all, were all discussed that week, uh, and they're doing a great job in their respective clubs. The campaign itself 
generated 12 million Twitter impressions globally and significant wider media coverage. And while that was just the start, I think we can all work together to showcase some of the great things that are happening in women's golf so that we can attract more women into our beautiful game. On the girls' side, whilst we've increased the number of girls taking part in golf through their schools as part of the club golf programme, girls' membership remains fairly static at club level. And we continue to see a drop off when girls reach teenage years. To address this, a couple of years ago, we launched This Girls Golf Initiative, which brought younger girls together in regional hubs. And we ran three events uh, last summer, of which we built upon with 10 new events this summer. We had 140 different girls taking part in these events over the summer. And we had a, a fantastic event also at Kings Barnes with the, with the Kings Barnes Girl Classic. And we're using some of the girls involved in that program to again gain insights to help us improve the work and start uh, attracting more of their peers within to the game. If you take a look at the screen, hopefully you'll see some of the, the girls in action at Gull and at the West Girl Golf events. Hi, I'm Carol Harvey. I'm the Women and Young People Development Manager at Scottish Golf. We're here in beautiful Gullin tonight at the launch of this girl golf's on tour. We've got 15 young girls here playing with the assistant pro from Gullin. They're here to take part in activities, fun coaching and, and generally get to know one another. This girl golf's on tour primarily looks to bring girls together that are perhaps isolated in their clubs and that don't have many friends and don't have many people to go out and play golf with and we're trying to bring them together regionally um, so that they can make friendships and moving forward won't feel as isolated and stay in the sport for a long time. Thanks there to Carol and this girl golf will again be rolled out to our clubs next summer. Moving on to the Women and Girls Charter that Andrew mentioned, the NRA have been making great strides with their support of the women's game since merging with the LGU last year and are investing more than £80 million over the next 10 years globally to grow female participation in the sport. The highest profile initiative was the Women in Golf Charter back in May, which called upon the golf industry to unite and focus on gender balance within the game through clubs supporting measures and actions to encourage more women, girls and families into golf. Charter also called for positive action to push more women towards careers in the golf industry and invite clubs to create a much more inclusive environment that will hopefully allow our game to flourish, a flourish even. Our challenge to you today then is to get your client club signed up to the RNA Women in Golf Charter. But we don't just want this to be a piece of paper or certificate that hangs in, in your, on your notice board. We want this to, to be an active part of your club strategy going forward. And we really need clubs to live and breathe the, these changes. To enable this, Carol will be working on a number of initiatives and we'll be providing a toolkit to allow clubs to help make some of these changes happen. Our aim in 2019 is to get 100 clubs signed up to this charter, hopefully we'll get more, but also committing to the actions needed to make those changes happen. These include equal access to tea times on a Saturday or other peak times, as I talked about earlier, moving to ability-based teas rather than gender-based teas, grow female representation on, on committees, and senior roles within the club, as well as providing a much more family-friendly environment and increased visibility of women in your clubhouse and other measures that really try and demonstrate your commitment to changing a male-dominated culture. Scottish Golf will shortly be providing guidance to clubs, uh, asking how to get or, or supporting how to get involved in the chart, and we've already had a number of clubs asking, so that, that's a really encouraging start. So this toolkit is going to be early, available early in, in the year. So the final part of my presentation revolves around the, the Solheim Cup, which we mentioned a couple of times uh, today. And I think we're all looking forward to what's going to be a fantastic event at Glen Eagles this September as women's, the women's game's biggest team event comes to Scotland. The eyes of the golfing world are going to be on us once again. And we've got the added bonus of a Scottish captain with our own Katrina Matthew leading the European side. And this event provides everybody involved with Scottish golf, both at national, regional and a local level, to have the opportunity to do something positive and impact with some of the initiatives that I've mentioned today. We also want to line the fairways with as many people as possible, and we'd love you to, to all be there for the event. We want to have women and girls, boys and men, golfers and non-golfers, to deliver a spectacle that the home of golf in the 21st century deserves. And we're looking forward to launching our own Solheim Cup Club Ambassador Scheme next month. And we're searching for one person at each club to fly the Solheim uh, Cup flag in their community. 
And we're going to be incentivizing this with a number of excellent rewards and an excellent benefits package so that you can get access to tickets and discounts and merchandise from our partners at Ping. We want as many clubs as possible to celebrate the Solheim Cup and get clubs involved in, in the build-up to that event like we did at the Ryder Cup four years ago. Part of that, we want, we want those women who have been involved in the club ambassador program to stay involved at their club in the future. And hopefully, uh, being involved in that particular program will give them a flavour and a taste for making positive changes at their golf club. So we're really looking forward to working with you all on this, in, on this initiative. The atmosphere in the first tee at Glen Eagles, I have no doubt, will be equal, if not better, than that of the Ryder Cup, particularly if those bloody guardians aren't there on the first tee. So it would be great to see all of you room present at Glen Eagles in, in nine months' time. And to whet your appetite further, I'd like to introduce a short video that's, that's sure to get the hairs on the back of your neck standing up before we welcome Visit Scotland's golf PR manager, David Connor, onto the stage to say a few more words about the event. Just the atmosphere, you can't beat it at a Solon Cup, and that's what makes this event so special. The nerves, it outweighs anything. Just, it's so great to be here, it's a dream come true, and I'm super excited. Great stuff. So I can ask David Connor from Visit Scotland to come up and say a few words about the 2019 Solheim Cup. Thanks, Ross. Well, I, I don't know about you, but the goosebumps and the, the hairs on the, the, the back of my neck are certainly up after watching that video, and I've probably seen it 20 or 30 times now. So uh, hopefully it gets you excited about that event coming next year. Um, amid all the, the talk today of how to engage women uh, and young people in golf, it's almost as if, as if by accident we have the world's biggest golf event coming to Scotland next year. Five years on from the, the Ryder Cup, we feel it's incumbent upon Scotland as the home of golf to be leading the way in the, the drive for equality uh, across golf and across sport in terms of uh, the, the profile of, of, of women's sport. So reason, really the, the, the reason for me being here and I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak about Solheim Cup is twofold. One really is a, a call to arms uh, for the Scottish golfing public to come out and support this event uh, at Glen Eagles. As Ross said, we really want the fairways to be packed the atmosphere on that first tee to be electric, really supporting Katrina and, and her European team looking to wrestle that trophy back from the Americans. This really is uh, Scotland's event. Uh, we have a, a global reputation as the home of golf and, and, and a great stage for uh, hosting major events and we want the Solheim Cup to take that to the next level uh, and really instill a feeling of pride across Scotland that we have this wonderful event coming to the country next year. We've set ourselves a really ambitious target of 100,000 uh, spectators over the course of the week. Uh, that would make it, uh, by quite a distance, the biggest women's uh, event ever held uh, in, in Europe. Um, it's an accessible event for those of you who were at the, the, the Ryder Cup. Uh, that was obviously there was a, a premium uh, price to pay on that, 120, 130 pounds or a ticket. Um, 
From a Solheim Cup perspective, we really want to make it an, as an accessible event as possible. The ticket prices start from £10 for adults uh, and all children under the age of 16 are free. Very much want it to be a family orientated event and uh, obviously we're uh, encouraging clubs to organise various outings uh, to, to that event, be it groups of, of men, groups of women, uh, or even encouraging uh, juniors to, to come along uh, as well. And uh, certainly there will be a number of, in as, of incentives, as Ross touched on earlier, uh, to deliver that. The second reason for being here really is, again, just to say please take advantage of this major event coming to Scotland. We invest in bringing these events to Scotland for a number of reasons, to promote ourselves as a global golf tourism destination. The media profile that goes with these events is huge, and we obviously want to encourage more golfers to come to Scotland uh, to play golf. But equally, they're a great vehicle for change and uh, to attract golfers within Scotland, new, new uh, golfers within Scotland to, to play this wonderful game. So really, it's a, a plea to use, use this event to help you encourage new members, to help you go out and, and um, try and recruit new women and young people. Certainly at my club, that's a, that's a huge focus for us. Uh, all clubs these days are looking for new members and that really is a, a, a great untapped resource there. So we'd encourage you to be looking at Solheim Cup focused uh, open days and events, perhaps mixed competitions. Uh, as Ross touched on, there's collateral available to help you do that. Uh, we, as, as the owners of the event, have the ability to provide you with various uh, bits and pieces of marketing collateral, you know, even up to the extent as if, you know, if you've got something really exciting, we have the trophy available that we could potentially be bringing along to, uh, to clubs. So as I said earlier, the Solheim Cup really can be a, a catalyst uh, for this change uh, alongside the great work being done by Scottish Golf and, and other clubs uh, across the room. And as I said, it really is incumbent upon Scotland as the home of golf to be leading this charge. So we hope to see you all at Glen Eagles in September next year, supporting Katrina and our team. Thank you. Thank you, David, and bring on September 2019. Uh, to wrap up then, ladies and gentlemen, I think to make change happen, Everybody in this room today has to be the leaders of change and, and be at the heart of that change and really live and breathe it and not just kind of talk about it. As a national governing body, we can only do so much and ultimately it's down to the people involved in running golf at the grassroots level with our support to make that change happen. I'm delighted to welcome three people up on the stage this morning who are involved at their clubs, who've worked with Scottish Golf to give their side of the story and share their experiences of successes and the work being done at their club. And also to celebrate that year of young people, we also have a talented young golfer from Ayrshire who's come all the way through from club golf into the Scottish Golf Performance Academy to share her thoughts on what golf is like growing up as a junior golfer and a member in Scotland. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce our, our club panel onto the stage that Emma's going to host a Q&A with. Uh, the captain and junior convener at Carbridge Golf Club in the Highlands, Scott Henderson. Secretary at Douglas Park Golf Club in Bears Den, and Scott. <laughs> Junior member at Presswick St Nicholas and Air Belisle Ladies Golf Club, Rachel Foster. <laughs> and the very well-known PGA professional at North Inch, Pitt Lockery and Noah's Art Golf Centre in Perth, Neil McGill. Pass you on to Emma. Well, thank you very much, Ross. I'll let you come down before I come up. And thank you very much to David uh, as well. So, some very pertinent words there spoken about the Solheim Cup. Uh, and if I can just be allowed a moment to say that I started playing golf because of the Solheim Cup. So when you're being encouraged to take your members to this event at Glen Eagles, which is such a showpiece occasion for us here in Scotland next year, please, I would implore you to do it. I was very fortunate as a youngster to meet Annika Sorenstam. I then went home, set the VHS, yes, that's how long ago it was, the VHS, on to record every single minute of the Solheim Cup and then implored my parents to book me some golf lessons. So it does work. And here we've got a reason to be thankful that it is here in our country next year. So please do pay attention to the Solheim Cup and use it for the benefits of your members and to try and drive new members in your golf clubs uh, around Scotland. So 
enough about that. We will continue to talk about the, the Solheim Cup, though. But thank you very much all for being here. Um, it, it really is. Are you enjoying the conference so far? So far, yep. so good. Good. Yeah. good yeah. yeah. OK, so we're going to ask some questions here now. And first of all, if I can just ask you individually to explain who you are uh, and why you're here today to, to give everybody an idea. Uh, my name's Neil McGill. I'm a PGA professional. Uh, I own the Nose Art Golf Centre in Perth, which is a golf driving range and retail shop. Uh, I also manage the local municipal golf course at North Inch in Perth and run the professional golf shop at Pitlochry Golf Club. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rachel Foster. I'm here representing all the junior golfers in Scotland and I myself as a golfer. Uh, I've been through the kind of whole club golf and academy programme. So. Yeah, I hope I can uh, share some insights on what the juniors think about golf. Thank you. Hello, I'm Scott Henderson. Uh, I'm captain at Carbridge Golf Club at, up in the Highlands, a small nine-hole course. And I'm here to talk about juniors as well as show what good practice we've done over the past five years to build the club and the membership. Hi, my name's Anne Scott, um, Secretary at Douglas Park Golf Club. Um, I'm here really to talk about the getting to golf for women's initiative that we've been running for the last couple of years and how to the things we learned and the things we we shouldn't have learned but um, but hopefully give you some insight on how that was a success for us thank you very much so well scott let's start with you if you can explain to us perhaps some of the the key areas of support that you've re received for, from scottish golf over the past 12 months uh well it's past five years really it all started five years ago um we have a, a great club development officer up in the highlands willie Mackay. Mm -hmm. And through him, we got some training for a couple of the committee. And at the time, I was a junior convener. And we got training on uh, business planning. And through that training, we created uh, six core areas. And through that, the club has developed, the committee has developed. And that was really the start of it. Um, Scottish Golf have provided us with flexible membership training um, and also PGA level one training we've got three coaches mm -hmm. so and there's various other areas but those key areas were really sort of were the catalyst that changed the way Carbridge developed uh, and made the focus more clear instead of having a committee that sat and argued and didn't have any path to follow so that was the main the main area and Anne I'll ask the, the same question to you about your own course Sixteenth. Uh -huh. um, I went and attended the Scottish Golf Club Association seminar, um, and that was to do with how to attract members to uh, the golf course. Um, one of the things you find when you try to put some. Sorry, am I going on and off? Yeah, I'm not sure. So something. I'll just check its face in the right way. Uh, I think it's might just curled over, so if we can do that. Let's sit like that. Yeah. Like my husband would love the button to turn me on and off. And to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if that's uh, any better. Or, yeah. Is that okay? Is it working? Is we've, got a so we've got a sound engineer on his way, jogging, breaking into a, a light jog here. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. That's super, thanks very much. Um, as I say, about s September 2016, uh, with my club captain at the time, we attended a Scottish golf seminar, but seminar about how to attract new members to the, the club. Um, one of the big bits of information we actually got out of it was where, Scott, where the club membership was in terms of the age, how many people were playing, etc. And one of the things when you try to put a kind of project in place at a golf club is nobody believes that the figures are there that we have to do it. So what was great about this particular seminar was that it gave you all the figures, average age of female golfers, average age of male golfers, playing membership percentage, and it gave you a little box to put in what your club was, and I put the figures in. And I was able to go to the committee and just show where we are, where we are compared to the actual national average. And it was the, the lady captain at the time who galvanized her team of volunteers into actually establishing that there was a reason that we needed to introduce more ladies into Douglas Park Golf Club. Um, with Sean Laird, who is our club development officer, they galvanized themselves got a fantastic leaflet drop. In fact, the lady who's now taking my video at the moment is one of the key <laughs> participants in that particular project. And we had a fantastic uh, open evening. Um, I'm now about to show my age here. We had a course safari in a la Dactari. Uh, we didn't have Clarence the Cross-Eyed Line as such, but we, what we did was we actually took members 
out into the actual course to show them what it was like. Um, the 57 ladies thoroughly enjoyed it. I think the YouTube video is still about. Um, I think screams were fairly high proportion. Um, but what it does was just to show how fun golf was, um, to demystify the fact that coming up the driveway to that golf club wasn't a big thing. And out of that 57, I think it's, um, we got about 17 ladies to join up. And from that, our pro actually then got involved in a kind of golf programme where it was group led, which we found was the ideal way to do it. What we then did was the lady section got um, a buddy system going. And what the key thing for the pro was, he decided we've got to get these girls onto the course as quickly as we can. And what we actually did was develop a blue, blue tees, and we've now course rated it. 150 yards in from all of 18 holes, so you don't have to stand in front of that horrible first tee in front of the golf shop with every day saying they're not looking, but they actually are. And um, so they could walk out and actually then play the game of golf. These girls have been fantastic. They've got their own WhatsApp group. They're fantastic ambassadors as well for moving forward. And this year, because this was last year we did it, this year we didn't even do the big golf event. We just had them as the ambassadors, and we got another 20 ladies to join this year without even putting the same investment in. And of these original ladies, we've got half a dozen now who are full members. There was a couple of people who did fall out, but what they did enjoy was at least having the idea to see, could they actually be a member of a golf club mm -hmm. for a year to understand the whole thing? And that was fantastic. So they've been really good, and um, this year I hope the rest of the ladies will become full members. So it really has been a success, and it really is down to the hard work of the ladies' section at Douglas Park. It's been fantastic. Oh, it's very encouraging and very rewarding to hear that, that it's had such an impact. And Neil, just talk to us about some of the initiatives that you've been implementing uh, at North Inch. Yeah, so North Inch Golf Course, we uh, started a kind of transformation project back at the end of 2014, start of 2015. Uh, golf course had been really struggling uh, condition-wise and our numbers had dropped uh, dramatically and the course was at the point of uh, being potentially up from closure uh, from the local authority. So the first thing we did really was we, we again, working the Scottish Golf, we, we used the uh, survey tool that Scottish Golf had and we, we effectively tried to find out what uh, our membership was, what people wanted and what they were looking for from the golf course. And we discovered from that that the, you know, the condition of the golf course and the way it was set up was what needed altered. So we worked very hard to identify our golfing is not the elite golfer. We're there for the, uh, the average general player. Our average handicap, I think, is 18.3. So we decided to cut most of the rough away, make the golf course much more playable. We then looked at, as a local authority golf course, how we could make golf as accessible as possible to everyone. So on a junior side, we don't have a practice facility, but what we did is we created a six-hole short course in part of the, the first two holes of the golf course. So we now have two sort of temporary greens that are permanently in position on the first and second holes. So we have a short six hole course that is used both for our juniors, uh, for our beginners, for our ladies groups, that just makes it easier uh, for them with the shorter holes to get around. We also looked at the affordability side. So we ran what we, what we called a, a golf club amnesty. And we asked people to hand in unused sets of golf clubs because as golfers we tend to stockpile clubs uh, that may just uh, one day come back out of the garage again this has given us a large stock of golf clubs that we offer free of charge uh, for people to play and the other things really i think with most golf clubs the, the, where it's working is communication that was such bad between the local authority and the golfers and it's something that we've really worked hard on doing uh, is, is improving the communication and allowing golf to be more accessible to, to people, isn't it? Yeah. Communication and obviously having the, the clubs there that are yeah. available for people to use who perhaps don't have their own set or are not sure they want to take up golf Absolutely. yet. That's, it's an yeah. investment, isn't it? Of course it is, yeah. It's, it's not one of the cheapest sports to get into, but actually there is so much equipment there that if it's there available for you to try. And we also use that with visiting golfers that come to the area as well, but just make it easy. Our junior programme, we have free clubs again for juniors to use, uh, and our junior programme use all of, those, uh, all of those also. And we have direct links into the schools and the health and social care side, which I think is so important for, uh, for golf going forwards. And talking of juniors, Rachel, this is uh, your cue. You are a junior member. Mm -hmm. What is it that, that junior golfers find appealing these days? Um, well, I think in terms of joining clubs, I feel that sometimes it's maybe not accessible for juniors. I feel there's quite a few age restrictions and quite a lot of people are nervous joining clubs for the first time. Uh, I also feel quite a lot of juniors complain about like lack of facilities and uh, tea times after school because I know it does get kind of dark and cold at night. But yeah, I think the main problem is the social aspect. There's quite a lot of maybe older members at clubs quite a lot of children kind of want to meet other juniors and get involved and have social events at clubs and they can get involved 
through golf through that. So sp specific events, perhaps at certain times that the younger members can, can go yeah, along definitely. to and see each other? Yeah, I think quite a lot of people complain about timings, quite a lot of medals are during the week, quite a lot of people are busy, so just having kind of events at night or after school is quite handy. And Scott, I know that at, at Carbridge you've done a lot to encourage junior members. Just explain to some of the, the uh, activities yeah. that yeah, you've organised. I agree with Rachel. It's, it, kids nowadays have got so much to do at school. We have a problem actually choosing the day we're going to do the coaching mm -hmm. because they've got so many different activities during the week. Um, and it's, uh, children have so much choice. And, and it feels like unless they get, are good at golf, they won't continue it. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to encourage the ones who aren't the stars to continue playing golf. I think that's across the board in golf, isn't it? We've all been yeah. there. <laughs> because the, I suppose the idea is to, is to make a golfer for life mm -hmm. out of it and uh, maybe you might get a member out of it. One of the things we did at the start is well, one of the rules when I became junior convener was that they had to join for 30 pounds before they could enroll on the coaching. Mm -hmm. Well, I got rid of that. I said, well, you don't have to be a member mm -hmm. to come and join the junior program. So as soon as I did that, we had uh, 20 children every Monday for a, a 10 week program. That was five years ago and we're still this year we did 17 children and for the size of our club we've only got about 300 members it's mm -hmm. it's nearly about 10 percent so it's, it's not bad um but yeah I, i'd agree it's it's difficult to 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 keep the interest so you've got to you've got to have games you've got to keep it fun uh have fun competitions little texas scrambles mixed in with the adults as well involve the parents barbecues mm -hmm. all sorts of things yeah, it's more of a, a lifestyle choice as well, it's isn't it? It's a social, it? yeah, yeah. yeah. When there are so many options for children now. But Neil, how do you feel the, the PGA and Scottish Golf can, can work more closely together to encourage more juniors to take part? Yeah, I think what was uh, mentioned earlier about this new programme hopefully coming forwards, I think just having both the PGA and Scottish Golf working closely together on that, I think, is absolutely key. Uh, I think in most golf clubs that have a PGA Pro, and I know and I'm involved in one that, that, that isn't, because at North Inch I'm not actually the golf pro there, um, but I think in the clubs that have a pro, the pro is the centre, he's the first person that everyone comes, he's there, he meets and he greets, and, uh, and him or her are absolutely key to the centre of that. And I think the other things for me are at some of the events. I think where a smaller clubs, it can be quite difficult to reach your market. You know, we don't have budgets to get out. I think associations like of Scottish Golf and the PGA can help us put the message out there. But I think things like of going to events that are non-golf. So mm -hmm. we have f fantastic um, setups at like of the Open Championship and Scottish Golf, where we have you know golf lessons going on. But I'd love to see things going into the Highland Games, going into different family events that are non-golf. Yeah, um, people who wouldn't people normally be at a golf event. Exactly, yeah. as of, yes, and going to get people who are not thinking of golf and making it this fun way. And that's where I think the associations working together can really help us with that. And do you agree with that? I mean, obviously, um, you, you yeah, get into golf programme as well. This year especially, um, we took part on the Live in the Green event uh, as part of the European Championships. Um, Scottish Golf asked for volunteers. Didn't quite realise how much hard work it was going to be, <laughs> but I have to say, after four or five hours, I was so enthused coming out of the, all these youngsters. Yeah. I mean, from that high, wanting to try and hit a ball into a bucket on a yeah. Volkswagen bonnet it was absolutely fantastic. And what really got me was the fact that people, the parents, just didn't know where golf courses were. So, and what the great thing is about golf, though, is the end of the day, we just want people to get into the game of golf. It'd be lovely if they come to Douglas Park, but at the end of the day, we just want kids to get into the game of golf. And even though I was there, and most people were from south of the River Clyde, but it was fantastic to see just the enthusiasm. And that again was within an environment where there was all types of sports. There was cues all over the place to get in, and it really was fantastic to see. So really, that kind of initiative was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And also, what we got out of it was a little bit of advertising in our local paper to say we're involved. So that, it was all, it was a win-win situation for us in that aspect. And it's one of the few sports and games that you can actually play regardless of age. You know, mm -hmm. you can still play it with your parents, your grandparents, with your children. So it's open to, to everyone and it's encouraging the, the next generation. You're obviously very much part of that, Rachel. We heard about the Solheim Cup earlier. As a junior, as a female player, how excited are you about this coming to Glen Eagles? Uh, very much so. I mean, I've always looked up to all the golf pros, men and ladies especially, and I think it inspires so many kids. I felt that I got into golf by watching all the kind of big tour events. Mm -hmm and seeing that it is possible to get on tour. People like Katrina Matthews, 
is Scottish born herself. Yeah, it definitely inspires so many people. I think this event will definitely encourage many juniors, including girls, into the sport. And it's a great opportunity, isn't it? Even if you can't make it to the Solheim Cup, if you can't get a group to go, to have a social event at your club to, to maybe at least unite some of the, the people from your membership or your surrounding areas to come and watch it together. We, when the Ryder Cup was down at Glen Eagles, we took nine juniors along to that. And there were no girls in that group. Mm -hmm. um, we've now got six girls in our programme, and hopefully one of the coaches will take them to the Solheim Cup. So th they, need, uh, they need some role models, um, some stars. So locally, we've got Hannah McCook. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a good starting point. And I think role models and uh, people to look up to are, are very important in sport. Um, that's where it all starts from. It's the media as well, and like yourselves, BBC or whoever. Mm -hmm. BT Sport. <coughs> BT Sport. <laughs> and there Shameless are, plug. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, it's been fantastic getting your insight and Scott, Rachel, and Neil. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Give our panel a, a warm round of applause. You will be delighted to hear that it is now time for the business part of the day. It's lunchtime. So there are sandwiches uh, around the room. So if you please help yourself, take them back to, to your table with some tea and coffee. We'll be commencing the, the afternoon session in about 15, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
ladies and gents. Ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you are enjoying your lunch, the tea and coffee. We are going to commence with the afternoon session in about two minutes' time. So if I could ask you to take back your sandwiches and your, your drinks to your table, we will get on with the afternoon session very shortly. Thank you very much. So very good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, once again we'll get the afternoon session underway. Hope you're suitably fed and watered from the lunchtime selection here at the EICC and that you're enjoying the day so far. Uh, we've already looked at the development of the game and how your club can benefit from the support of Scottish golf. We're now going to take a look at how Scottish golf plans to use digital technology to take a look at golf and the unseen areas that this can now benefit your club. Please remember, you can submit your questions through the Slido app on your phone, or through the website, sorry, on your phone. So feel free to, to engage with what is being said on the stage. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. For now, though, I would like to introduce Ian Forsyth, Chief Commercial Officer at Scottish Golf. Thank you, Emma. Good afternoon, everybody. Don't fall asleep on me once you've had your sandwiches. So we want to look at the future. Why do we need to look at the future? Why do we need to make changes? Adoption, how people take on adoption to change. Choices, the types of choices we have in our everyday life, not just golf, our everyday life. And what's our plan? What are we going to do to move the game forward? So why do we have to do it? Eleanor mentioned earlier that 50,000 people have left the game in the last 10 years. And if you look at the slide, that's a lot of people. That fills Prince's Street, 50,000 people. 
That's a very hard ship to turn around. But more importantly, 25 million pounds a year has now gone out of membership, subscription fees, gone with those 50,000 people. So the mountain, it's a big mountain. We get it's a big mountain, and you don't need me to tell you how big that mountain is. I moved back to Scotland about three years ago, and I, over on the west coast, and um, the local club to where I lived, I thought I might join. I hadn't been a member of a golf club for 20 years. Uh, and I looked at the proposition, it was 550 pounds to join the golf club, and that seemed like a reasonable sum. But then I looked at how much a round was gonna cost me, and it was 10 pounds. 10 pounds on a deal every day of the year, and it doesn't matter whether I like golf, don't like golf, or how I viewed the proposition. If you just from a cold commercial proposition, I knew I wasn't going to play 55 rounds a year. So was that worth doing? And that's the challenge. That's the challenge we've all got. And so what we need to do is help you with this solution. We need to enable you, and we need to give you the platform to try and make this a level playing field for everybody. You know, the smallest clubs, we want to give them the same foot up as the bigger clubs have. And we need to adopt to change. We all, every one of us, we accept change in a different way. You get early adopters. Then you get people who just want to wait and see how it goes and they might come a little bit later. But when you look at the businesses and the successful businesses around the world, every single one of them has adopted change and moved with the times. If they haven't, they're gone. I came into the golf business in 1991 and when you do the math, that makes me feel very old. I, I played a lot of golf as a kid. I'd had some great coaching from some great PGA pros. In the mid-80s, I was lucky enough to be coached by Bob Torrance, who was absolutely fantastic. But the idea as a young kid that you had to go for a playing interview to see if he would coach you was probably the scariest thing I'd ever done. I was a sales rep. I was tell, selling Terry's chocolates around Scotland. And I saw an advert for Nike Golf looking for a rep. I thought, happy days, I can have my sport and have my job. So I applied, I got the job. I thought, how hard can it be? The biggest sports brand in the world, and all I've got to do is sell to golf clubs. That was my first mistake. The golf business is not an easy business. And so when you go back, this, that shoe on the, on the slide there was actually the first athletic shoe that we brought to the market. And everywhere I went, I was told, even if I like the shoe, son, there is no way the committee's going to let it on. It's not going to happen. And it was hard. We had a few classic shoes. We had some bits and pieces that, w that were acceptable. But as a rule, this sports company coming into our niche business wasn't really, it, it wasn't very welcoming. So I was up and down the country, and it's, it's strange. All these years later, I can still remember the Gordon Gray at Dumfries and County Golf Club was the first person to buy Nike shoes from me. The fact that I can remember that now I can tell you how big a deal it was at the time. I just felt the monkey was off my back. But I was traveling the country and it, it wasn't an easy sell. It really wasn't. But as a young kid, you start to see early adopters, people who think the way it might be in the future versus the way it is today. And I remember going to Aberdeen. I was told, go to Aberdeen, see Bruce Davison. He's got a good shot. So I went to King's Lynx, saw Bruce. And it was just a weird reception. He said to me, you got an application form? Just give me it. He filled it in there and then. And then he, he gave me a check for 3,000 quid. I said, don't you want to see the shoes? He said, no, I'm not really interested. He says, all I know is that you're a big sports brand. And one day you'll get it right. And when you do get it right, I want to be one of the early adopters. And I want to be recognized as somebody who stocks the brand. And to me, that, it, was, it was an eye opener for me. That's someone who had a bit of vision. He knew he was getting nothing out of it that day but I bet he's one of the main Nike retailers in the Aberdeen area now. So we got a little bit of traction prior to actually having a golf division. We had back-to-back -back wins with Curtis Strange, but that was more just dipping the toes in, seeing if it would work. Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, didn't believe that golf was a sport. Golf was a hobby for fat old men, and he was not going to invest in that hobby until he met Tiger Woods. Then he realized that an athlete could become a golfer, and an athlete could change the face of golf. And if that's going to happen, I'm going to invest in that athlete. $25 million opening contract 
That was the biggest contract any golfer had had at that moment in time. And it paid off. He signs him in 1996, 1997. Tiger wins the Masters. Now Phil Knight's looking like a genius. He was an idiot six months before for offering the guy $25 million. And so the brand starts to create a little momentum. Worked out great for Tiger, worked out great for Nike. And I think he's been fantastic for the game. Absolutely fantastic. By that time, I was the sales director for Nike Golf in the UK. And I remember I got a phone call from a golfer one day. You never get a phone call from a pro golfer. The manager phones. And I should know that because I managed Fowler for seven years and I had to do all the phone calls. But I had a golfer and I just thought, how strange. This guy said, I hear you make good golf shoes and I hear they might be quite comfortable. And he said, do you mind sending me some shoes because I struggle with my feet a little bit. I said, sure. I think I sent him three pairs of golf shoes. Three months later, if my clicker works, there he is. Paul Laurie wins the Open in Nike golf shoes. The ultimate endorsement and the ultimate adoption for any brand is when somebody wins a major with product they chose to wear. Brands can't buy that exposure. But Paul's from Aberdeen, so as soon as that was finished, I had to pay him. But up until then, it was a fair deal. And then the brand, once the brands get momentum, then they start telling you, they start dictating, they stop asking the questions. None of these brands, Ricky Fowler's guys, they don't come knocking the door saying, hey, is it okay if I get my stuff on your golf course? They got power then. And they drive change. They don't ask. And that's what people like. That's what's exciting. Ricky Fowler is an exciting golfer. You look at the picture of Ricky there. He's got his kind of high top boots on. He actually looks like he's tagged. But uh, it's actually worse than that. He's double tagged. But he's got cuff trousers on. He's got basketball boots looking things on. And yet he's, he's an inspiration for the sport. And we, should, we, we embrace people like that. It's, it's the future, and it continues to be. Tiger, ironically, was a lot more conservative. Tiger used to wear wind socks. Nike didn't make those. They had to get them specially made. And he, he tried to be so conservative. So you, you need brands. And there's Jason Day on the left there. You, you need guys that are just willing to go with the change. So I only wanted to share that story. It's a kind of an adoption story. I was there on, on, if you like, day one. Nobody wanted it. And now, it eventually, adoption happened. It just happens at different times. So we look at the world we live in. We'll just move away from golf just for a little bit. Look at the world we live in. Number of years, thanks to Stuart Darling for this slide, the number of years it took 50 million users to engage with something. And look at that closely. The airline industry, 68 years before 50 million people got involved. Now, we need that. We need the cars. We rely on them for our everyday. But yet, Pokemon Go can do it in 19 days now. Who needs Pokemon Go? Apparently, 50 million people do in 19 days. But it's quite clear to see in this chart that it's where the internet kicks in is where everything speeds up. And that's where the game changing starts. How many of us in the room have got a smartphone? Come on, I'm only gonna do this once to you. Hands up, smartphones. Okay, how many has got that Nokia phone on the left hand side? Come on, someone's gonna do it, I knew he'd do it. I bet you haven't got it on you. He does. <laughs> Who planted him? All right, that's the bad, the thing is he can't communicate with anyone. <laughs> and we don't know when we actually made the change because we all had that Nokia phone. But now all of a sudden we've all got these other phones, but they're not phones. They're massively powerful computers. They're powerful communication tools. And we don't know, they, they just kind of made their way into our life. And it's the visionaries that do things like this to our life and change our life. You know, Steve Jobs didn't walk down the street with the Nokia phone and ask people what they'd like it to look like because they never would have come up with the phone that we live with today. Bear with me on this slide. Everything is, is, is in, in our lives, some of you are as old as me, things happen quickly. Look at Google, 1998, not that long ago, well, 20 years ago. How did they set themselves apart? If I said to people, what's Google? It's a search engine. It's way more than a search engine. It's got under your skin, and you don't even know it. You want to translate something? Do it on Google. That's not looking something up. 
Google decided to do maps. Why would they do maps? Google Maps. We all use it. When you got the satellite view, the lovely HD satellite pictures, most of us probably would have started paying at that point. I don't mind 99 pence a month. I don't mind a pound a year. This is, this is good value. And then they took it a step further and spent hundreds of millions of pounds. They'll just drive cars up and down the street all over the world so that you don't have to worry about the satellite view. You can have a street view as well. We definitely would have all paid for that. Visionaries, absolute visionaries. So now it's become vocabulary. You don't say to your friend, I'm going to World Wide Web it. And to the point to the brand on the right, you also don't say, I'm going to Yahoo it. They didn't get with the momentum. Google did. They're under your skin. Facebook. 20-year-old kid comes on the scene. What rights he got to take over the world? MySpace came on the scene at a pretty similar time. A little bit of a battle going on between those two in the early days. News Corp bought MySpace for $580 million. Because they knew it was the future. They didn't know how to do it, so they'd buy it. They put some well-paid suits onto that because they knew this other kid was coming along and they were going to take him out. Forbes magazine will tell you, why did Facebook win and why did MySpace lose? Because MySpace was going to determine what you all needed because they were very well qualified and very rich. And the young kid decided, I'll let you decide. I'll give you options and I'll be led by you. I'll be led by the people. He's got 2.2 billion users a month now. MySpace, News Corp, gave up the ghost pretty much in 2011. They were in for $580 million and they sold it for $35 million. Lesson learned. Listen to the people. YouTube in there. Google was clever again. It bought YouTube very early. And people would say, well, it was a waste of money. How are you ever going to make money out of YouTube? Streaming times are poor. Data storage is massively expensive. How's that going to work? They had the vision. They knew storage was going to get cheaper. They knew streaming was going to get faster. So in 2017, internet advertising spend passed television spend. Without doubt, it's now the future. And it's increasing by over 20% a year. Facebook also had the vision. They bought WhatsApp and Instagram down the bottom there. They paid $19 billion for Instagram. Idiots. No. They paid a billion dollars uh, for Instagram. I think it said Instagram there. And then you look at the poor relation down on the right-hand side. I put that in deliberately. Because Kodak is something we all used throughout our life. 35 mil, then all of a sudden it was all the paint to kind of wind it on. Then they did it automatically. Everything was great. That was the future. Kodak refused to accept that digital was the way forward. They said, they'll come back to us. Yeah, and this is where we need to take lessons for our 50,000. They said that it'll come back to us. By the time they knew they were wrong, it was too late. It was gone. They lost the opportunity. And to put that into perspective, 1997, Kodak peaked at $16 billion a year of revenue. 2017, $1.7 billion of revenue. Slide that's gone. Instagram, in the first quarter of 2018, over two billion in revenue. They've won the day, done. Choices, we all make choices. And we all make choices differently. You'll recognize yourself in that chart. 35,000 choices is what they reckon we make a day. 2,000 choices every waking hour, choice every two seconds. You're all making choices right now. Some of us impulsive, yeah, whatever. Whatever comes, I'll, I'll take it first. You're compliant. You delegate. You don't want the responsibility. But we're all, we all make choices. And industries know that. And industries change. Everything can be changed by how people interact with you. Physical businesses. 1995. Did we need another airline with EasyJet? No. Freddie Laker and all these guys, they're going out of business. Why would we need another airline? Because Stelios decided he's going to do it differently. Into Glasgow, 2999, the big 0800 number. Then he started coming into Edinburgh. Because his attitude was, no, no, I'll give you the choice. I'll give you the basic price of a seat. It's up to you if you want to bring a bag. Now it's up to you if you want to sit at the front of the plane. You want to sit in the emergency exit. Pay the extra. 
Go back to the 50 million user chart with the airplanes, took them 67 years. It's taken them just over 20 years to get to 80 million users, change the industry. You'd go into Glasgow Airport, loads of people here will have done it. When they, when they launched, the business guy, he's going down to gate 18, 19, 20, he's a British Airways guy. The backpacker that goes off with EasyJet. Now, complete opposite. Everybody uses EasyJet. To the extent that British Airways now pretty much mirror what EasyJet do. You pay for the bag, you pay for your food when you're on board. So the industry changed. Amazon, Stuart hit on Amazon last year. Total game changer. It's not just a shop, it's not just an online shop. They're thinking ahead all the time. They've got 300 million users there. In America alone, Amazon sell 500, over 526 million different products. And as if that wasn't enough, they've got Amazon Prime, 100 million of us on Amazon Prime, happily paying $7.99 a month. Why? Because they just make it easy. We all just want what's easy. And then if, if, if you can't find what you want on Amazon, don't worry, if you buy it somewhere else, they'll give you Amazon Pay. You can still use your Amazon account somewhere else. 33 million of us do that. So it's ease. App on my phone, on my fingertips, how easy can this all be? I've only got IKEA in there because it was quite an early sort of one, but I put the IKEA one down to the kind of Dragon's Den model, and I just wonder if any one of these three would have got through the Dragon's Den. And I can just see the pitch for IKEA where the guy goes, I'm gonna have this big blue shed, huge. I have loads of furniture. Oh, well, it's just gonna be the same as MFI. No, 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 it won't be MFI. I'll build a track and they'll walk around the track and they'll see all the stuff as they go around it. It'll all be built and uh, yeah, that'll do. Yeah, but you'll need a shop assistant. You need quite a lot. Mm -mm. I'll just put out paper and pen. Make them write it down as they go. Oh, a little bit Argos-like. Oh, no, 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 no. Once they get to the end, I'll open up the warehouse. They can go and get it themselves. 780 million of us willing to do it, handing over 40 billion a year. They must have something right. Now, this is where we want to start thinking about how we're working with, with, with the golf clubs. These guys don't own anything. They're enablers. Biggest taxi company in the world. They don't own taxis. Facebook, the biggest content, one of the biggest media content providers in the world. They don't produce content. You produce the content for them. And Airbnb, they were determined that you would be willing to go and stay in someone else's house, and they just enable you. They would just hook you up with you, and it would work. You look at Travis on the right-hand side. He's a happy boy in that picture. He's a happy boy because he just found out he's worth $7 billion. Mark Zuckerberg, when he floated it, $30 billion he's worth. He's now worth 54, so it was clearly a good deal for the stock exchange. Whoops. And our friends at Airbnb. A lot of people think that these tech guys, they just get it easy. They don't. Airbnb went through 20 rounds of venture capital funding just trying to get going, and they couldn't do it. They decided that they would get into the breakfast side and, and do cereal. They did, they did celebrity cereals. They did Obamos, which are Cheerios, and Captain McCain's, trying to get into the whole Democrat scene. They actually sold cereal at $39.99 a box and sold enough to make $30,000 to keep the business going. Anything to keep it going, and it proves successful. So what's our offering? What are we gonna do? Well, we want to enable you. We wanna give you a platform for free to try and get everyone on the same page. Every, you know, we look at all those figures that I've just shown you, billions of people, billions of people. If we can just get tens of thousands of people on the same page, then that's gonna help us all. Give or take, our, our golfing population is just over 800,000. But it's been said a couple of times already today, the membership makes up about 21% of that. So why don't we just try and engage with 100%? Why don't we get 100% trying to help us pay all the bills? So into the details. What are we going to give you uh, from a, a platform point of view? The first thing is we're not taking commissions out of anything. So with regards to our booking platform, anything that is booked, you'll get 100% of the money. It's not gonna be a tea time booking system, it's gonna be a venue booking system. So you'll be, able to book, you'll be able at the back end to put what you want on it. Golf lessons, catering, functions, junior clubs, whatever it is, we're gonna try and enable everything to be easier so people can just book things through an app, pay through the app, and you're gonna see that with the tech guys in a short period of time. 
And the choice is 100% with the clubs with regards to the non-member affiliate, which basically means you can have the software for free, even if you don't want to open up competitions to the non-members that Andrew was talking about earlier with handicaps. The control is completely yours. This is an opportunity. It's not any kind of dictating from our side. It's an opportunity. That's for the golf clubs, and the guys are going to go into it in a little bit more detail. Golfer categories. So clearly there is a new category in the middle. With regards to members of golf clubs, everything through the app is going to be free. All access is going to be free. If you are a member of a golf club and you book a tee time at another golf club, you won't pay any booking fees. It'll be free for you to use. The new category. We're basically trying to move in, trying to embrace this 100% of the people and get into the Netflix world. People are happy paying small amounts regularly if they feel that there's value in it for them. So we'll charge these people $4.99 a month and they will pay a slight premium on a booking fee. And they'll have access to competitions only where the golf clubs invite them. There's no right to come and do anything. It's where the golf clubs invite them. And the guys will come on to more on that in the tech. And realistically, going forward, we want national competitions for all golfers. We want everyone to be able to play in competitions. <coughs> and what would it mean? So I, I started the presentation talking about 50,000 golfers um, going away. I could turn around and use a number of 100,000. Wouldn't it be great if we did something with 100,000, 200,000 people? But 10,000 people, if we could just get the last two years of people who left membership to U-turn and come back the way, if they wanted a handicap, that would take 30,000 rounds of golf. Ballpark, three quarters of a million pounds going into the golf club pocket on green fees. The affiliation fees, the money that would come to Scottish golf to be reinvested into the game. Per 10,000, you're looking at about 1.4 million, and that's if they only played those three rounds. That doesn't include any revenue for the rest of the year. So really, it's, we want golfers to decide how they play the game. We want to embrace all golfers. But more importantly, the power remains with the golf club. It's your choice. It's your choice how you engage with this. So before I pass on to the tech guys, I'm going to be really cheeky. Some of you might have noticed we've got Paul Laurie in the room. And I just thought I'd see if he would be willing to come up and have a little chat with us. You want to come up, Paul? Come on then, can we get my mic? It might take me a little bit of a while because I've had a little bit of surgery, as you might know, but I'll get there eventually. Where's the crutch? The crutch is gone, thank God. <laughs> my kids are calling me hop along. This is clearly the informal part. Hurry up. The one thing you never mentioned about the <laughs> shoes is you charged me for those shoes. I remember it very well. I didn't well. charge you. Yeah, yeah. Tell you. All right, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't. I'm a little bit intimidated because an Aberdeen fan, this is a lot of people, let me tell you. <laughs> How are you? Good. Can I sit down, sit down or do standing you, up? Or? Do, you want, do you need to sit down? Oh, definitely. Oh, my God. I'm going to get a buggy when I play seniors tour, so oh, I may yeah. as well sit down. Right, come on. I do. Okay, so you've hobbled up here. Yeah. Why don't you give people a little bit of an insight into your foot? what you actually had done, how your recovery's going, and uh, if you're going to get back out there. Well, I've got some, uh, I've got some videos on my foot, if you want to see them. No, the surgeon no, sent me a lovely no. video of the operation. Um, I had a ruptured tendon uh, on my foot and a torn ligament. So it's 10 weeks ago now, 10 weeks on Monday. Uh, so I'm getting there. Obviously, I've got the big boot off, which is nice, because that was, that was not pleasant, sitting six or seven weeks with a big boot on. I'm always been quite an active uh, kind of person. I'm always here, there and everywhere and doing things and involved in a lot of stuff. And then to be told to sit on your fat bum for six or seven weeks, you know, it was quite difficult. They don't call me patience for nothing. That's always been my nickname. <laughs> so uh, to have to do things and, and slow down and not go anywhere and I couldn't drive my car and oh man, it's just been a bit, but I had to get it done. You know, I'd, I'd been struggling for about five years with my foot. So now uh, he's happy with what, how it's gone. He's happy that I can get back to playing golf. Uh, going forward from end of January, so I'm looking forward to it. It's been uh, a wee bit difficult, but man, you know, we all have things that we need to kind of put up with. Yeah. Well, following on from the Open, you started your own management company. 
How's that going and who, who have you signed, who have you got on board? Uh, well, first of all, uh, we look after uh, Sam Locke, who obviously won the silver medal at the Open last year. Sam was our first client. Uh, David Law, who got his card at, from the Challenge Tour last year. They're our two uh, main clients. Obviously, I do my own stuff. You know, I've done my own stuff for, for a long time. Um, and then my son, Craig, uh, obviously joined us as well. So we've got four of us uh, so far. Uh, Michael McDougall, who runs our foundation, is doing some bits and pieces with it as well. So Mikey's doing all the flights and, and all, the, all the bits and pieces. And I'm out there trying to sell some deals for the boys to you know, get them going. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, it's good. It's a bit different. Um, I've had no, no tantrums from the golfers yet. You know, I've had a few tantrums myself over the years with were management you, were groups. Were you the perfect so, client? Uh, no, 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 I was a little bit hard going, as you would imagine. But, <laughs> you know, it's when you, when you do what we do and, and you're passionate about what you do, you know, sometimes that, that spills over, you know, whether you're whether you're a good guy or not a good guy. Um, sometimes sport, it's a, it's a professional game and it's a, it's a game that you get uh, into. Um, but I'm enjoying it, you know, it's been good fun so far. Um, I wasn't sure if I could play, you know, anymore. So I wanted, uh, is, we've got a golf center obviously, we're in Aberdeen, but I wanted something that I could be involved in. And my youngest son's at Stirling, he's doing business sport management at Stirling. So he wants to go into this sort of side of things. So. Five Star was basically set up for Michael to do a little bit of the football and, and, and I would do the golf. So we'll give him the profitable bit because, you know, football agents make a few quid and I'll do the other <laughs> bit. <laughs> well, listen, you're obviously passionate about junior golf. We've seen quite a lot about junior golf and Ross spoke quite a lot about it earlier on. Give us an update on the foundation. How, how's that been going over the last few years? You're obviously still heavily involved in junior golf. Foundation's good. Uh, it, it had a little dip uh, a few years ago with the oil price, obviously, mm -hmm. in Aberdeen. That affected us hugely. We've got a lot of oil companies that are sponsors uh, of the foundation. So of the 18 sponsors we had for a while, we had 11 pull out, you know, pretty much at the one time. So that was obviously quite stressful to try and keep the money coming in and keep the money going. My wife and I are hugely involved in it. Uh, Marion's at every event. And uh, I'm, I'm obviously, when I'm home, I'm always at the events and speaking to the kids and trying to encourage them. And uh, the kids are great. You know, the kids have always been great, you know, in the foundation. They they buy into what we're trying to do. We're trying to get them to have fun. We're trying to make the, the golf courses a little shorter for them, a little easier. Uh, the tees are, are well forward. Uh, we play holes of 175 yards of a maximum for the kids, so they're not struggling away, and, and you can throw it out of a bunker if you're in there for too long. And I think, you know, it just takes a bit of time. I mean, we've been going since 2001. And we've looked after thousands of kids in that time. Uh, David Law has been in since he was 13, and he's now on the tour. So, you know, we're having some success, but, you know, it takes, it takes a little bit of time. And uh, the biggest thing for us, I heard Ross saying that I think the idea is we need to ask kids, you know, more often uh, what, wh how we need to change it. And we do that a lot at the foundation. And dress code is always the thing that right. is the answer I get. The old kids always say, well, I don't want to change to, to play golf. I want to come in my, in my kind of clothes that I wear when I'm in the house. So that's something that we've obviously got no dress code in the foundation. I think there's been a huge difference on that. They're now bringing the little sisters who didn't used to play golf and little brothers. So that's always something that we try and kind of encourage. Uh, we want them to come and have fun and play golf and get into it. I mean, I, I've obviously I'd loved, you know, being involved in golf all my time. And we're just trying to pass that passion uh, on to the next generation. But it's, it's tough. You know, it's, you're up against iPhones and mm. iPads and computers and you know it's not easy uh, and the numbers are down a wee bit to, to where they were a few years ago but obviously there's a pile of us working pretty hard and I think we're we're getting there. Well like a, a lot of people in in the room here obviously you know running a golf club is a hard thing and passion and labor love for a lot of people you've got a golf club is it easier for you because you're Paul Laurie or is it still a challenge to run a golf club? No it's uh, it's uh, hugely uh, challenging uh, obviously no matter who, who you are uh, the golf industry has not gone through the best of times and hasn't done for a long, long time. Our facility currently runs a slight loss uh, every year and has done for a wee while. Uh, you obviously, we have a lot of people that work very hard and a lot of talented people who work with us. And we've recently become an SGU affiliate club, so you can have yeah. a handicap with us now. We put in a couple of tees to have two par fours and seven par threes, so you can play a medal now with us, and that's helped a little bit. But again, we only had something like 28 or 29 new members when we put that in. So, you know, it's a little bit of a struggle. And, uh, you know, interesting, obviously, from before, when Andrew mentioned the, the people that are not members of a club being able to have a handicap for a club like us. You know, if you're, if you're saying that we can lay on a competition and we can have 40 or 50 new golfers playing a green fee every week for us, that could be the difference. You know, for mm -hmm. us, it's a lot of money for a golf club that loses money. Um, but, you know, like we also said, you know, 
change is change is not easy. You know, mm -hmm. change is difficult. I'm I'm nearly 50, and you know, my kids are smarter than me and cleverer than me, and tell me that every day. So we've got to listen to them as to what you know what they want. But the golf center is great fun. I enjoy it. You know, but it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't make money at the moment. Mm -hmm. But that's obviously something that we're trying to get it towards. And at the moment, it loses a little bit. Yeah, you had a sneaky preview at the app earlier on, and you can see what we're mm -hmm. trying to do. Is it something that, yeah, I'm being really cheeky now. Is that something that you would have at the Paul Laurie Golf Centre, do you think, in the future? Firstly, I like how you've written out some questions and I never even knew I was coming up here today. It's quite, <laughs> quite cool, isn't it? He's got a little well, list I had of to questions wing it. there. I had to wing it. Yeah, I had a wee look at the app, obviously, when we're sitting at the table, and oh, man, it's just phenomenal, you know, what you've been able to do w with that. And obviously, Lee, I've known for a little bit of time, and uh, for, a go for a place like us, a golf centre like us, you know, we're now going to have this app and it's going to be free for us to use to get people in about. I mean, who's not going to who's not going to want that, you know, as a golf club? And I'm sure you're going to show it to everyone yeah. now and, you know, you're going to be blown away with what you're going to see. We certainly, as a golf centre, will be using it and we'll be embracing it to try and turn the corner for us. I think it will. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming up. I think I've kind of overrun and overstayed my welcome here. So what I'm going to do, um, we're going to mosey off and i'm going to invite lee proba and joe persh from uh, ocs to come up and really show you what they've built so far and show you what we see as a digital future so thank you for listening Hello. The microphone works. It's a bit loud. Yeah, working. Yeah. Testing. 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 Welcome. My Scottish Golf Club. We've uh, we've we've built you a little app um, and a little product that will hopefully help you guys take control of your business. It's not our business, and it's not about us. It's certainly not Scottish Golf's business. It's yours. So let's take a look at what we've done so far. Good one. <laughs> Relying on someone pressing play, I think. Ah, there Beautiful. We. So, <clears throat> as Ian touched on previously, sort of the big digital transformation that's happened in the last 10 years, or the story behind that, is actually the rise of the platform. Had some examples like Uber, Airbnb, and, and really, <coughs> they're platforms because they're not the business themselves. They empower other businesses to grow. One of the main ways is obviously product distribution. You've got a spare bed, spare seat, rent it out, one night, one drive, whatever. And really, the platform has what has revolutionized the world, and that's what the tech industry's really done. And it's been a game changer. And it's taken away a lot of manual processes. You don't have to worry about, you know, if you run in B&B, &B, you have to worry about, oh, who's coming today? What's going on? I've got to make notes. You don't need to, because Airbnb just take care of it. It's done. And that's the big change that's taken place. And at the start of this process, speaking to clubs and speaking to people, like Lee, who's owned and run a golf club, really, we got a feel for all the individual things they needed. And we realized that actually, Currently, there is no one platform that allows you to do the whole thing. There's a series of individual software tools, and they're great. They're useful. But like Excel, they really only do one thing very well, and some other things kind of well. So <coughs> software tools are not transformative. They're not going to change your business. They're going to help you run it, but they're not going to fundamentally make things better. <coughs> so we thought, well, we'll build a platform. If you know the guys in Silicon Valley can do it, we can do it. It'd be easy. Not that easy, but uh, <coughs> we started out with, well, what do you need? What's what is a golf club? Well, really, you got a product. What is your product? It's tee times. Now, whether you sign someone up for a year for a membership, or you sell them one tee time at a time, it's the same thing. You have a product, and you need to take payment for selling that product. And obviously, this is the core of what your business is. Now. There's obviously things that already do that, and you know they're great, I guess, and probably quite expensive in their way, but they're not 
really taking it that next, uh, next step further and giving you that platform for change. And so you end up with a current position of some individual software tools that are disconnected. Yeah, We don't have that platform. We don't have that unity. We don't have things that automatically talk to each other. Someone enters a tournament. I've seen people go and update spreadsheets that are getting put on the website. Now, it's 2018, and the world is about automation. It's about product distribution through digital products. And we don't want to have these individual disconnected products anymore. I'm not just here to push this. I've got to do some talking as well. So what have we built? So obviously, Joe's explained what we looked at. We looked at your businesses, and having some experience of, of how to run one of those businesses is not easy. And you're all brave for doing it in the first place. So we've gone off and we've built what, what we call a venue booking system. So even though it's going to do your core business, which is golf tee times, whether you've got one course, two courses, 12, however many you've got, nine holes, six holes, it doesn't really matter. The point is, each one of those tee times is your product. That's what you have. Once it's gone, and it's gone at the lowest possible price, it's gone. You can't get it back. So we're going to enable you to set your own pricing. You can then determine which revenue center gets that money. It may be that you've got two courses on one site run by two separate companies, two separate entities run it. So depending on who or what gets that money, it goes to the correct party. And that's all going to be integrated right from the start. So we, once we've done that, we started twiddling our thumbs, and we went off and started building a few more things. Now, obviously, we had a lot of these tools to start with. But uh, everyone's going to need a membership system. You've probably already got one. A lot of you will already have systems that you use that controls your membership. But it doesn't actually do an awful lot for you for the non-member. So we want to start collecting data for people that come to your venue. And data is key. Without the data, you can't use or do anything. So let's collect that data. We've got a full tournament management system. And we'll run on to why we think that's going to be quite cool a bit later. Handicapping, currently Kongu. We're Kongu certified. Um, and there will be a WHS in the future, and we're working with some partners at the moment to build one of those. A full communication module. Communication. I heard it earlier in the, in the presentation. And communication is key, and it's full two-way. And it'll be within the platform, not in your Outlook, not in your Google, Gmail, in your system. And it's yours. It's not ours, it's yours. We've built in a virtual caddy, uh, we've, which is a, a GPS caddy in the system. We're going to give you a free website, and every club will have one, and the design will be pretty much bespoke. There's enough different themes and options to choose that pretty much every golf club in Scotland will be able to configure one that's unique to them. We're going to give every golf club in Scotland a dedicated app. Now, that might not sound like a huge great thing to all of you in here, but I'm telling you now, the younger generation, they only use apps. They do not use computers, and computers are declining in sales 20% year on year. Now, maybe that's because they're getting better and they're lasting longer, but that will eventually stop. And it will be apps, tablets, on handheld devices. And we've also thrown in a point of sale system, obviously quite important. You need to collect your money. And that gives you a perfectly integrated platform. No more sporadic digital products. Oh, I've got to check on someone's emailed me. I've got to check that someone's booked a tea time. No. All in one place easily administered, no more manual work, no more forgetting things, missing things. Everybody can coordinate within the business. The pro and the shop and the club and the bar, everything can be under one cloud, coordinated inside one platform. Everything can talk to each other. The app, driven by the data from your platform. You put the data in, you put the tea times in, it powers the app. So it's yours, you're in control of that. You can choose who gets those, who doesn't get those. We spoke about product distribution in terms of digital products. You need a website. People, maybe on holiday, whatever, want to look for a club, they're going to search golf clubs near me. You need a beautiful, engaging website that actually has your character in it, your course images, your color, your theme, your brand, with a website easily configured. Simple drag and drop, put your course images in. Put the, all the course details, the pars, everything. All in one system. You do it once. You don't have to do it five times. Put it in one system, one platform. 
It gets spread everywhere. You choose the colors. You choose everything. It belongs to you. It's your website. And <clears throat> obviously, that's the, the, the web side of the product distribution, but really, as Lee touched on, really, it's an app. You know, If you want to get a taxi, you get an app. If you want to have somewhere to stay, you get an app. If you, apparently, if you want to date, you can also get an app for that. So you know, everything is about the app now. And, uh, and that's where we've put a lot of our focus and attention on making a really beautiful user interface, easy to use, intuitive, and really integrating perfectly with the platform that you guys at the clubs administer. We obviously didn't have enough time today to go into the back end system. I mean, and we, we could spend three, four, five hours up here talking. You, you'll be asleep, I promise you. But what we want to do is show you this app. So the idea is we want to put this app into everybody's phone who wants to play golf in Scotland. Now, it's up to you. You don't have to use it. You don't have to promote it. You don't have to do anything with it at all. But if you do, we guarantee you, you will generate revenue. I'm not going to sign up to anything like that. But we guarantee we're going we're gen to generate extra revenue for you. We've made the sign-up process simple. It is very, very simple. With GDPR as it is nowadays and PCI compliance for payment solutions, we, we have to take certain data if people want to make a payment. But the actual process of signing up will be simple. And you will have access to that data when people want to come to your golf club. Admittedly, let's get your members using it because they're your members. Nobody else will have that data. It's your members, yours only. The booking journey. When we, we started this process probably about I don't know, six years ago when we started looking at a booking system. And what was really quite disturbing was the number of clicks you have to make to make a booking. First of all, you've got to sit in front of a computer. I know things have changed now. Some people do have apps. But six years ago, it was difficult. Even today, one of the most successful golf courses in, in Scotland, just to get to the payment section, took 17 clicks. 17 clicks. It's a lot. That's a minute. It's a whole minute of your time just to book a tea time. The young generation don't want that now. It wants to be a few seconds. And engagement will, will happen. So from choosing your club, selecting a date, select a time, book. Four clicks. And you'll be booked a slot. You have to be a member to get the four clicks. It's five clicks if you're not a member. And you've paid for something. The money has been extracted instantly. The whole app will have the payment system in it. We've got a cookie with a worldwide bank. And we've, we've secured a major deal with a worldwide bank who is prepared to supplement every transaction, every card transaction. And again, you get all of that built in this app for free. Competitions. Competitions. Who plays in golf competitions here? Put your hands up. How easy is it to get into one? What have you got to do? Pick the phone up? Go to the golf club? Write on a sheet, write on a book, go back two weeks later, see if you see what your tea time is. It's in the app. You'll have a platform that'll enable you to put every single golf club competition in the app. If you're brave and you want to engage in this new future, you can put some open events on. You tick a box, this tournament's open. It appears on the open slide, the open button in the middle. So every open tournament in the entire golfing community will be in that app. You can enter it. You're a member of another club, bang. You've got a handicap, bang, you can get in. The national body will also have a system that will run their national championships. If you want to play in those, you click on the national button, and you can see which ones you're eligible for. If you're not eligible for a tournament, you won't be able to enter it. It won't allow you to do things you shouldn't be able to do, but you can sit there and watch them. You can enter. We've taken some liberties here. We've got the Ned Bank Golf Challenge in there. Um, you can enter, you'll see the entries list instantly when you're entered. If it's, a, if it's a, a type of tournament where you need to be authorized to enter, you won't see, it'll be a provisional entry right up until the time when the draw is made. The draw is made, you'll be able to see the draw. And then you'll be able to see the scores because we've built a real-time live scoring system into the app for you. If you're in the competition, you'll be able to do the scoring in your app. You'll be able to swap cards effectively in your app. You wouldn't even need to take a scorecard out onto the golf course. It's in your app. You can print it out afterwards if you really want to do it and sign it. And hopefully, with a bit of luck, we can just store it all digitally. 
you won't need to use scorecards at all. Another saving for your golf club. And to add to that, what you're seeing here on the screen is tour level technology. Okay, this is coming directly from apps that we've built for the professional golf tours of the world. So we're putting tour technology in every golf club in Scotland who wants it. Free. Okay, I'll mention that. Can I carry on? Yeah, carry on, sorry. <coughs> the caddy. Now, Paul was lucky probably to have a caddy. Was he any good? Okay. <laughs> so, must have worked once. <laughs> Not everybody can afford a caddy. I get it. And caddies in amateur tournaments are, are obviously uh, sometimes frowned upon. So what we've done is we've, we've taken some technology that we already worked with uh, around the world and we've put it into the app. So within the app, there's a caddy button at the bottom. And what that actually means, it's a GPS caddy. It's, it's a, a sky caddy, uh, a GPS mapping service for your app. And again, there's 38,000 golf courses in there. I'm sure you know, you're going to play at most of them, most of you. You'll be able to use it anywhere in the world, not just here in Scotland. So if you go anywhere, you can use the app to, to track your way around the golf course. We did a search, actually. There was seven miles of here, this building. There are 31 golf courses. That's incredible. There are so many options for you to go and play golf. So let's involve everybody in this. And that's what it looks like. When you've got the GPS up, depending on where you are using your device, it'll tell you how far you've got left. And that's not actually a great one. There's front, middle, back, and all sorts. You can have pin positions on it and all sorts. So that's what you're going to get. And again, this is included in the app. Social events. Now, golf is one thing, and booking tea times is one thing. But social events, how difficult is it to organize a social event at your golf club? Anybody done it really successfully recently? I thought not. Social events. We'll do the same thing. You can create an event in the system. Now, that's not just for you. That's for open events, so you can open it to everybody who's out there, even the non-member non golfer. Let's get them in. They might want to join. Once they know it's a nice little family, they might want to come and join. So let's engage with them. And the national body, so things like this, they can advertise it in here, and you can decide whether you want to do that or not. Golf's app. I think we get away with it? We might get in trouble with that. Golf sap. What's golf sap? Broken. We're in. Find other members and users. So you're signed into this app, OK? It's, it's two-factor authenticated to get you in. So you use your fingerprint or your face ID or a password. And you'll be two-factor two authenticated to get started in it. So it's immensely secure. So what we've done is we've built in a chat function. So it's golf sap. Sounds familiar to something else. I don't know what that could be, but it's golf sap. So if you have authorized your golf club to have or put your details in the member directory, you can, I can chat with Joe to organize a match play event, anything, a game of golf, anything. If any of you are in the contacts list, of anybody else in this room or in the country or in the whole country and you have the app, it will appear against your name in the all column. So you can chat using golf app to organize your golf. It's a bit tongue in cheek. It's designed to keep you in the app and, and keep you doing everything you would do golf straight in here. You can do groups. So if you do a society away days, you can do it all in the app. And it keeps everything where you want to keep it. You don't have to go download anything else. Nice chat we had. Now, everything in this is user-focused. We have built this based on our experiences and everything we've listened to. The future of this product is what the user wants, not what you want, and certainly not what we want. So the user will determine what new features are developed for it because they'll tell us. And the data that's in it is the user's. It's not necessarily ours, it's not ours at all, it's not even Scottish Gulfs. It's the users. So the user is responsible for that data. If they decide that for some reason they've joined, they're not a golf club member, and they want to leave tomorrow, they push the button, delete, everything's GDPR, they're gone. If you're a member of two or three golf clubs, which I hear is normal, you change your name or 
you change your email address or your postal address or anything, you change it in the app, it'll change in all three of those clubs at the same time. They obviously need to have the back-end platform to make that work. But this is all about centralizing a completely decentralized network. Sounds confusing. That's very confusing. Together, all of us here, not us, everybody, we're going to put golf in your pocket. So you can see it as and when you want it, not when someone else tells you you can. And you can book tee times at any time. And we're going to give you all of that with Scottish Golf's help for free. I can't hear you. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. It's number two customer. <laughs> so who are we? We haven't told you much about us. And really, is it that important? Probably to help you understand where we come from. Founded in 1988, we were set up with the initial start of personal computing. And obviously, people needed computers to do certain things. And this product started in 1988. Presently, today, we automate 32 professional golf tours internationally. Now, that's the LPGA, the PGA Tour, the European Tour. Uh, we do work with them. Today, there are two European Tour events happening. We are administering the whole shebang. And I say administering, we have a team of 16 people in our building. It's all done on a platform that they do themselves. There are 11 tournaments happening today, professional, and we are here. And our phones aren't ringing. So we must be doing something right. Just some uh, simple stats. We do about 2,800 professional tournaments every year. So far this year, that's the number we've up to. 32 million pounds has been taken through our systems and our payment solutions with uh, tournament entry fees approximately 11 million in professional tour membership fees, and that's just about to go through the roof because the LPGA launches on Monday. We have 40 million US dollars taken in Q school entry fees, which is staggering. People go into Q school to get on this dream of being a professional golfer. And so far this year, we have paid out the equivalent of 983 million pounds in prize funds. Dollars, pounds, dollars in prize funds. So our customers must trust us to do what we're doing. So we're hoping you guys will jump on board and allow us, Scottish Golf, to unite you all and put golf into someone's pocket. The platform that is powering golf is yours for free. That's all we have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much there to Lee and Joe. I think uh, we all agree a bold move into the future and as has been detailed recently, it is for you to decide whether or not you would like to use it with your own golf clubs. Now, we've had questions coming in throughout the day here and we're going to get Andrew and we're going to get Ian back up onto the stage to answer some of those questions for you. And I believe, uh, Lee, are you also coming back up? No? <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll put him on the spot up here. So we've got some of the questions here for you that you've been submitting through the Slido account. And as I mentioned right at the top of the day, anything that isn't answered today, it will be answered retrospectively. It will be communicated with you through the email addresses that you've registered here today for all of your clubs. And it'll also be on the Scottish Golf website as well. So please don't worry if whatever it is you have asked, we haven't got time to get round to today. So are you guys all mic'd up? Yeah, you've yes. all got your microphones Hello. on. Yes. Okay, so the, the questions are on the board here. So I'll, I'll kick off with the first one here and it says, when will clubs be given access to the new online portal for management of handicaps so to assess usability and sustainability? Well, from a platform point of view, literally as this presentation finishes, anyone who's been here will be emailed uh, a registration form, a registration of interest. Uh, we will then collate those. We will then look at who's interested in the system. We will then communicate back with you. Um, in January, we will then go to, through a testing phase with all of the interested clubs. And after that, then we will move forward into a more formal rollout. But we, there was, there's no date at the moment, if you want to say, on the rollout, because the most important thing is that we listen to you guys and we get the testing phase correct. And when we're happy with that, then we'll move to the next stage. 
The second question on there, I'm not sure if Lee actually answered that in the presentation, just can the digital platform be used in areas, or Andrew, if you want to pick this up, uh, areas and countries, and what does it offer us? Yeah, for the areas and counties, it certainly is something that they can use. In particular, I'm sure you'd have been excited by the tournament uh, side of this for the tournaments that you all run, and it's absolutely something that will be available to them as well, free of charge. Okay, moving down the questions. Are we not in danger of pushing golf club members away to nomadic golf and therefore losing club level revenue by encouraging attracting non-member affiliation? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. That's, this is always going to be the big question around this. And I think the point I would make is 5,000 members are currently leaving our golf clubs every year. They're obviously not leaving because of a handicap. That's obviously not the issue for them. Um, to suggest that people remain members of golf clubs just because they can get a handicap seems to entirely miss the point. Less than 50% of members of golf clubs in Scotland have handicaps. There are a variety of reasons why people are members of golf clubs. If the handicap was so crucial to being a member of golf club, then people would simply go and find the cheapest club that they could join. As I said earlier on, there are clubs in Scotland that you can join purely to get a handicap already. That is not what's happening and therefore uh, we do not believe this is a, as big an issue as, as people make out. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, what stage has the development of the new club management system reached? This was a key aspect of the increase in the affiliation fee. Lee? I don't know, I just work there. All right. <laughs> um, basically, the, what you've seen today, what, you know, f f for showing purposes, clearly uh, there were screenshots, if you like, but everything you've seen and everything you've heard of is live. It's physically working in an app. So from a, from a usability point of view, the guys are quite far down the road. I mean, unless you want to expand on technically where that is. Yeah, we, we're, we've, can you hear me? Yeah. We've, uh, we've got to the stage of, um, we've gone far, way past beta testing. Everything's very stable. It works perfectly. Um, the app works together with uh, the back end, um, which is the most important thing. Even the registration process that you will go through when you decide that you want to sign up is all automated and it goes into some back-end systems that Scottish Golf will now use to, to look after you and communicate with you. So we're, we're hoping that by the first few weeks of January, we'll have a few beta customers out there who have gone through the, the first real beta test. But um, as far as we're concerned, it's, it's ready for release 1.0. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the new app for golfers, if a club decides to use it, will it seamlessly interface with the club's existing yeah. software, e.g. intelligent golf, etc.? Yeah. Uh, not at this stage. There's no open API. Um, we don't plan to put an open API in it because we want you to control the experience. And the only way you can control that experience is ensuring that every golf person in the whole of Scotland has the same experience. You start interfacing third-party applications, you start interfacing with you know, things that will not work. Realistically, just to add to that, it's not a case of trying to be awkward. We're very focused here from a revenue point of view and the challenge we've been giving, given is to try and take this product and it's, it's not my product, it's not Scottish Gold's product, it's your product. So you need to own the product and if you dilute that product and start integrating with loads of other products, slowly but surely you'll end up in the situation that you're in, where commercial parties will be able to piggyback on what you've done and come in and take commercial benefit. So it's not for any sort of, um, you know, it, it's not for any bad reason. It's a case of it's yours. We want to give it to you. We want you to run with it and control it and control the development of it. Another key thing here to say is one of the reasons that we have gone with um, OCS is because they're not in this space. I hope from what you've seen, you would agree that they have the credentials, they understand the game of golf, and they're a strong tech company. So unlike other companies, we, Scottish Golf, and you have an exclusive agreement with this company. They have no rights to go to the market in Scotland. So the development of the product is also in your hands. Thank you very much. That does conclude the, the Q&A. As I say, any questions that have been posed that haven't been answered will retrospectively be answered uh, and that will be communicated to you through the, the mediums that I mentioned a little bit earlier on. Ian, thank you very much for your time. Lee, thank, thank you. you very much thank you. for your time as well. And Andrew, I know you're going to, to offer a, a closing speech to us. Thanks very much, Emma. Um, you've heard a lot today. 
Uh, hopefully on the development side, I'd like to hope that all of you will have a much better understanding of the services that we provide. Please use them. You pay for them. Please use them. They are there. And I'm sure every one of you in this room saw something there today that you didn't know existed. So please use them. In addition, as I said earlier on, I hoped you'd leave this room as excited as we are around the technology in golf. And I'm pretty sure that that will be the case now that you've seen it. I would encourage sign up uh, to register interest in the system. Details of how to do this will be on our website and it'll also be in an email winging its way to you as I am speaking. I'd also encourage feedback and Emma will give you further instructions on this in a minute. But one thing we're interested in are your thoughts around the conference, around whether this event should be every year or perhaps every second year with some form of award ceremony in alternate years. Just something for thought. Truly, these are exciting times ahead. And as I said earlier on, we all need to work together to ensure we are indeed good ancestors and leave golf in Scotland in a better state than we found it and allow those that follow us to have as much joy as we have all had from the sport. But I think I've probably said enough, so I'll leave you with a very short video, which I think sums up everything we've heard today much better than I can. Thank you very much. When you're playing this Tri Golf Course, it makes you feel calm, really at one in peace. Scotland. For centuries we have nurtured the game of golf and given it a home. All your stresses just disappear. All your worries in life, they're just not here. It's so calm. It's a brilliant course. If you, if you were to ask me, you know, where did I want to spend my last moment on earth, it'd be here. You walk up the first fairway and you're literally breathless because of the hill. Then you turn round, you see the view and it takes away whatever breath you have left. It's, it's just amazing, it's, it genuinely, honestly, it's just such a peaceful place. It's not too difficult, challenging. Fantastic views from the, the fairways, fantastic views from the tees. The greens are brilliantly placed. It's a spectacular course to play. It's not just that we have some of the greatest golf courses in the world, but all over the country. We have taken what nature has given us and created almost 600 beautiful and amazing courses that are unique in their own way. Where in the world can an ordinary player access the game so easily? We've got Glen Eagles, St Andrews, Carnoustie. Well-known courses, but to be honest with you, if you gave me a choice to play anywhere on a day like today, it would be here. We can't, however, rest on our laurels. We must find new ways to bring new players and younger generations to the game we love. The world changes and life moves on. But we must work together to drive this sport forwards. If I had to sum up in one word how I feel about playing this golf course, it must be serenity. We have the heritage. We have the history. Let's make sure we have a future. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the future is in your hands. The future is in your hands uh, and that's a fantastic video really to showcase exactly what we've been talking about over the course of today. The world is changing, golf is changing and it is fantastic to see Scottish golf today unveiling some methods at which you, the clubs out there, can stay on top of the way it is changing. And it's not just talking about it today, it's giving solutions and methods that you yourself can implement change at your very own clubs and hopefully as a result 
grow your business within that as well. Equality, pay to play, the handicap reform. There are so many areas at which to grow the game of golf. And here today, I hope that you've had some insight into how you can do that on the varying scales of the businesses that are in here today. Embracing new ideas and modifying some of the old ones, I think, will put us on a very sure footing for the future of Scottish golf. The question now for you is, will you embrace it? Because that decision is now yours. I do thank you all so much for coming. Thanks to everyone who was up here on the stage speaking and, and presenting here today. Thank you for your time in travelling here. Thank you to those online who are watching us as well, to the EICC for having us here this afternoon. I do hope you have enjoyed it. One final point, if you have parked on Castle Street in the NCP, you can have your, your ticket validated and get it for a reduced rate of eight pounds before you leave the conference center. But all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for your time. I hope you found the conference worthwhile.